So carbohydrates and this meal threshold ingestion. Yeah, let's talk about that. What, okay. what, what does that mean for someone who's never heard that term Okay, before? okay. So carbs, obviously we know what carbohydrates are, whether it's, um, I don't know, rice or potato or fruit or, or whatever it is. It's uh, Those are just examples of carbohydrates. We often think about carbohydrates in a 24-hour period. How many carbs are you having per day? You're having, you know, the RDA for us is 130. The average American is having 300 grams of carbs. What becomes very important to understand is uh, from a practical aspect, I know we're going to talk about carbs, but I will mention, and I really want to talk about protein. The first meal of the day is the most valuable. You have to get your protein intake right for that first meal of the day. If we are talking about uh, perimenopause, menopause, and really anybody, because you are coming into that first meal of the day, catabolic, you've been fasting, you have an overnight fast. Hopefully you've de depleted some of your liver glycogen, which is the organ, the main organ that is really maintaining your blood sugar levels. When that happens, that first meal of the day, you want to practically optimize for protein between 30 and 55 grams per meal. That first meal of the day, you really want to hit that if you are a plant-based individual, you need to go more towards 55 because you have to account for protein quality and fiber or whatever is in there. But a minimum amount of protein is 30 grams for that first meal. But this is this is so interesting, right? So we're now going beyond the menopause and perimenopause, aren't we? This You're talking to everyone here at the moment, which is- I am, I am. But I know you wanted to talk about- Well, no, that's uh, okay. That's okay. Okay, okay. No, no. So for all of us, you're saying- overnight we're in a catabolic state which right. for people who don't understand we're sort of breaking things down so therefore unless you're waking up and eating in the middle of the night which i don't recommend yeah so, so that first meal and i love the way that you're not calling it breakfast you're calling it a first mm -hmm. meal which mm -hmm. of course let's get into timing as well in a minute but yeah. you're saying you've been catabolic you break things down so therefore yeah. what you need to give your body an anabolic so uh, growth, you know, put on muscle, you need to yeah. give it that anabolic stimulus. Is that why? Yeah. So this is, if people take away nothing else from this interview, this is, we are now getting into, we've conceptually talked about muscle. We know that there is stimulus required. We know that we have to do high intensity interval training. We know that you should have a baseline of cardiovascular health. We know how important it is to kind of embrace the suck as they say. Now we're moving into, so Exercise is the potent stimulus. Exercise is medicine. Muscle is the way to go. We talked about the movement uh, perspective and kind of framing that we are not over fat. We are under muscle. Now we are moving into the next most critical aspect of the conversation. The aspect of the conversation that is completely missed. If individual, and I'm highlighting this because if the people listening do the following advice and execute on the following advice that I'm going to give, they will change the trajectory of the way in which they age. Okay. Wow. That is my, that is my commitment. Understanding that the first meal of the day, I don't care when it is, is the most important and it primes your body for muscle protein synthesis. I don't care about your age at this point. This is the time. Listen, if you're young, uh, you know, like my three-year-old or two and a half-year-old, she can have 10 grams of protein and she's fine because they're very anabolic. But if you are an adult and you are listening to this, that first meal of the day is the most important and optimizing for muscle protein synthesis, turning on the machinery of mTOR, which is mechanistic a target of rapamycin, which is the way in which we think about muscle protein synthesis over a lifetime will be stimulated. If you are sub threshold, this amount of 30 grams, depending on your age, you will not stimulate the tissue. You, it's like being pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not. You're either stimulating this or you're not. If you are sub threshold, you do not stimulate this tissue. Okay. Th Why this, is that? Yeah. This, this is fascinating because let's say someone is trying to have some protein at breakfast. Um, I was actually looking at this just before we had this conversation. So there's some wild salmon in our fridge. Great. And, you know, one fillet has about 24 grams of protein in it, right? Okay. Right. So I think for those people who do, do eat fish, and I, I appreciate we're now getting into 
super controversial areas of animal protein v plant protein we're definitely going to cover that so i think it's important which was never controversial when i you know i've been like i have been mentored for the last 20 years by one of the world leading protein experts it was never controversial a decade ago it's yeah. crazy yeah that is crazy anyway. and we'll talk about that yeah. because i think it's important yeah. but just to make it really practical for people who do let's see eat fish yeah. You're basically saying if you do not hit that 30 gram threshold, you are not stimulating the necessary Mechanism. optimal mechanisms yeah. in your body. And I'm thinking, well, some people can't manage a fillet of salmon. Some people think oh, that, that's a huge amount. So therefore, this 30 gram uh you know, threshold, where does this come from? Like, why is yeah. it so important? What, what, what's wrong with someone having just 20 grams, for example? Yeah. And, and the science around this, and I, I work with Dr. Donald Lehman, and he's been in this field for the last 40 years. Wow. Um, yeah, he is an OG, the a grandfather. He would kill me for saying that. Don't worry, he never listens to my interviews. He would kill me <laughs> for saying he's the grandfather. Um, but anyway, he, uh, I work with him on these, he's mentored me again for the last 20 years. And, you know, initially we thought of protein as, um, an even distribution. And I'll get into that in terms of grams and even distribution. And when we think about protein hierarchy, we often, you know, the literature really says, okay, well, the amount of protein that you ingest in a 24 hour period is the most important. And I would say, um, yes. The 24 hour period of ingestion is the most important, but why leave it at that? We really need to think about targeting for skeletal muscle. And we know, and this actually was the work that came out of Dr. Donald Lehman's lab is one of his biggest contributions to science is that muscle is a nutrient sensor. Muscle is a nutrient sensing organ. And the way in which it does this as it relates to muscle protein synthesis is through one of the amino acids, one of the essential branch chain amino acids called leucine. Without leucine, muscle stimulation doesn't happen. Therefore, it is very, very important to reach and the way it does this, depending on as we age, when you are younger, you need less leucine to stimulate muscle. But as we age, the literature will show and Don has shown it and there's multiple other individuals have shown it that you get up to 2.5 grams of leucine to really begin to trigger this process. When you're younger, it's like 1.8. No one is going to go look at the back of a um, uh, label and say, oh, this only has 1.8 grams of leucine. And the reason you're not going to do it is because protein is totally underrepresented and it's not broken down in the label. Unless, of course, you're eating a protein shake or drinking a protein shake. The body requires a bump in amino acid in the bloodstream, specifically leucine, which is in high quality proteins to then trigger this process of muscle protein synthesis. Once that is, and we want to optimally stimulate that, which yeah. is why at that first meal of the day, the higher protein you can get, the better it is so you can turn on that machinery. After that, Okay, and let's talk about the, the filet person. So let's say you go, gosh, Gabrielle, I cannot eat more than one whole filet. No problem. An option for an individual is to add in a branch chain amino acid to bring up that level of leucine. What, so is, a now branch, we have a, what is a branch a chain bran amino acid? For a branch people? chain amino acid, you would use it in a powder, is leucine, isoleucine, and valine. It typically comes in a very specific ratio, which is two to one to one. So two leucine, one isoleucine and one valine. The reason it comes in in this ratio is because how the body processes it. You don't want to just add one single amino acid okay. just because of the, the mechanism. It will deplete the others. It would just, it's just not uh, ideal. So you can have your filet, you can have a scoop of your branch chains, and now you've raised the leucine threshold. The leucine threshold is what is necessary to trigger the mechanisms in the body to stimulate muscle. Getting that first meal right. And again, a lot of the literature is, you know, we don't know, we have an idea of how long that lasts in terms of that stimulation, but by really optimizing for muscle protein synthesis at that first meal, you have more flexibility on protein dosing for the rest. Got it. Got it. So this is really important. So a yes. couple of things I just want to say. So let's say someone was going to eat 100 grams of protein in a day, right? Yeah. Instead of having 10 
well, maybe maybe people wouldn't have 10, but let's say five times that they ate of 20 yeah. grams protein. Terrible idea. Uh, are you, you're essentially saying from that research that actually you're better off having two meals exactly. of 50 grams protein. So you're giving your body that bolus, you're stimulating yes. Yes. the necessary mechanisms. Okay, so that's a great takeaway for people, first yes. of all. Okay, great. And then that second meal. So let's say an individual says, well, I only want I only want to eat three meals a day, then the second meal can be sub threshold because it doesn't matter. You're really optimizing muscle protein synthesis twice a day. And people, you know, I, I think some scientists would argue with me and say, well, it's just really about the 24 hour period. But I will tell you, I, I don't agree with that. And in clinical practice, and again, as someone who is a trained geriatrician, we know that if you are coming up on anabolic resistance, you're muscle as a nutrient sensing organ is less effective and efficient. You want to leverage the capacity that you have control over to overcome some of that anabolic resistance. And that is easy to do and important. And because you are coming off a fast, your body is primed. And there's other ways in which we could lower that threshold. For example, Exercise actually primes the muscle for protein ingestion. You can actually improve the efficiency of muscle if you go train and then eat some protein. Yeah. But regardless, I really think a great takeaway is understanding the 24 hour um, protein. And I recommend one gram per pound ideal body weight. So, what would that be in kilograms? That's. Um, well, hold on. We said 140 pounds before is roughly 10 stone, right? So you're saying 140 grams of protein. Now, for a lot of people, that's gonna be a super high recommendation compared to what they're used to. Right. It's also different from what a lot of longevity researchers are currently recommending. Um, but I just wanna, I think this is super interesting. I'm happy to talk about that too. If there's time, we can, there's a lot of cover still, but let's hope so, because I, I, I mean, I, this is such a fascinating area for me, right? So. You're saying that you need this big bolus, right? You need this big bolus. It's not really about the 30 grams. It seems like it's about the 2.5 grams of leucine that right. you need to stimulate this. So are we essentially saying that for most people, for most common protein sources, you really need at least 30 grams of protein if you're gonna have those 2.5 of leucine. And you were saying before, if you are vegetarian or vegan, you may have to start pushing that more towards 50 to make up for it. Is that essentially the, the message? Yes. yes. And I will say that leucine alone is enough to stimulate muscle protein synthesis, but not enough to complete muscle protein synthesis. Wow. You need all the amino acids. You need all the amino acids. And that is why just taking a powder alone of branch chain amino acids will stimulate the machinery. But it's it's the equivalent to starting your car with no gas in it. Yeah. You do need all the amino acids. There, there's a couple of things here. Uh, I've been researching your work over the last two days in preparation for our conversation. And it just so happens that the last four days have been quite, um, quite stressful on a personal level because my mother, she's 81 years old at the moment, and she's pretty immobile these days. Uh, mm. On Friday, she had a fall where I oh had to gosh. go and um, basically Ugh. pick her up by myself in the ground, which is pretty tricky. It's uh, terrible. And last night, the same thing happened again. And you've mentioned a few times that you have worked in geriatric care, palliative care. Yes. Now, I just want to bring those threads together. Can you just explain, you know, yeah. falls is a big problem, right? You've worked in geriatric oh. care. I have to explain my own personal experience. Yeah. Put all this together for us. Why is protein, why is muscle so important? Well, I have to say that, you know, my time as a, a geriatrician was incredibly traumatic. Essentially, geriatrics is end of life. Um, obviously, I'm not saying that about your mom, but I'm saying in clinical experience, I worked at a nursing home. I did this for two years. I did hospital mm -hmm. rounds. I did palliative care. You witness people fall, you witness the aftermath of the fall, you witness the complete devastation of individuals with dementia. Um, and that is ultimately at the core why I became so vocal. Because 
I believe that if you have knowledge and if you have experience, it is your responsibility. And I will say that it's not always easy to be as uh, forthcoming as I am, right? As you know, there is a bit of aggression that comes back at me, but it's not about me. It's about the experience that by me sharing this, we can help your mom. We absolutely can help your mom. And that is a very pinnacle and poignant part of, of my personal experience. And frankly, one of the reasons I'm so vocal, because there's so much misinformation and people that have not worked with aging or have not seen aging parents, everybody in the middle is arguing. Everybody is arguing about longevity and nobody is talking about quality of life. Yeah. This idea of restricting protein to live five years longer is ridiculous. Has anyone experienced what the quality of life of having low muscle mass is, poor balance, low bone density, that stuff is devastating. When I think about an aging individual, you must prioritize protein because number one, like you said, they don't have an appetite. They eat less. The calories that they eat really, really matter. And again, we are now thinking about a different season of life. Are we thinking about phytonutrients? I mean, yeah, but that's the equivalent of window dressing on a beautiful home. You have to get the foundation right. Mm -hmm. You have to get the food matrix right. Then you can think about your elderberry syrup or your resveratrol or whatever else there is. But if you miss the foundation, none of that matters. Yeah. None of that is going to improve your survivability from a fall, which is one of the most critical aspects of uh, an individual who is aging, what they are at risk at. Resveratrol in and of itself, for example, you know, it's not like I'm just picking on resveratrol. I'm sorry, resveratrol, but you, we have to really look, take a big step back and look at the big picture of what the fundamentals are. And that is increased muscle mass, improve balance, have good uh, bone density and survive and thrive and be functionally uh, independent as one ages. And now I'm going to circle it back to dietary protein. We talked initially about anabolic resistance, meaning the efficiency of protein utilization goes down. The most important thing an aging individual can do is optimize protein. They can optimize their protein. This can help offset muscle wasting. It can help offset the fact that they might not be training as hard. It can help with blood sugar regulation. It can help with um, tr you know, improving triglycerides. It can help with blood pressure. These things are very valuable. So for someone like your mom, if we gave her a 30 gram whey protein shake, whey protein has a high percentage of leucine in it, I would be very happy. Yeah. And we gave her two meals a day that really optimized for her muscle and a little bit of creatine, five grams of creatine, I would be very happy. Yeah, I appreciate that because, you know, <laughs> I'm pretty on it with my mum's health and what she's doing you know but actually the truth is also when we're when we're really close we we lose objectivity yeah. like i totally. cannot be objective with my mum in a way that i can be with a patient yeah i, I know that supposed to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah not yeah. supposed to be. i'm her son and i'm trying to do the best right. that i can but i realize that actually yes we've been increasing protein for a while but we've not been hitting that threshold consistently. Right. And I think, wow, if mom can't work out or do resistance training, I think what you just said is really important. Having adequate protein intake is gonna reduce how much the muscle wastes, because the muscle is gonna waste, right? But we wanna slow it down as much as possible. I've heard you share some pretty, um, some pretty staggering statistics. I think you once said a statistic about women over the age of 65, if they fall, yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because that there's a whole slew of things that one would think, you know, what is their pre-existing conditions? Do they have diabetes? Do they have cardiovascular disease? What is their disease risk? And I can safely say that when an individual falls, their risk for all cause mortality will go up. And it's very devastating. And it might not be immediately, but oftentimes it begins a very rapid decline in health. Basically, if a woman falls, uh, she's 65 or older, her chances of walking and being mobile alone dramatically decrease, dramatically decrease. And obviously that's not everybody, but 65 or older, any kind of comorbidity, that 
risk of being able to be independent again is dramatically decreased. And th does this speak to the body armor concept you were talking about before? Presumably the more body armor, i.e. the more skeletal muscle that individual, that woman, that, yeah. that man has, yeah. then even if they do fall, that's going to protect them from a lot of the potential negative side effects. Yes. And then the other thing that we have to think about is did they fall because they're, you know, they have some kind of peripheral neuropathy? Had they had low muscle mass in the past? Do they have elevated blood sugar? Do they have cardiovascular disease? Have they trained their balance? You know, how is their proprioception? A lot of these things stem from skeletal muscle, yeah. can be augmented by taking care of skeletal muscle. So typically, by the time someone has mm -hmm. fallen, we already have a good sense. Again, someone could fall and trip. It could be medication. There's a multiple reasons as to why someone would fall, but we cannot discount that. You know, when I was in geriatric clinic, we used to test gait speed. We used to watch, you know, you know, a gait speed of less than uh, 0.8 meters per second. We used to also test sit and stand and the Romberg test. We, you know, we watched this and we know that as these decline, their risk of falls go up. Yeah. Let's go back to food and protein. Um, you've given your view very clearly on what you think people should be doing to optimize skeletal muscle, yeah. 30 to 50 grams of protein, particularly at the first meal of the day. Yeah. Now, let's go there. Animal protein versus plant protein. Yeah. Um, this becomes delicate because of the... Well, as you say, you've been studying this for a long time and it, and it yeah. never used to be controversial, but it no. now is. And I tell you the yeah. problem with the controversy is that many people are scared these days of speaking up. Now, I, I just give you a quick example here, right? A yeah. very quick example, which I think you may resonate with. I have a very good friend who used to be vegan used to have mm. raw food, used to be vegetarian, then went paleo. That's is literally very, very knowledgeable, very health conscious, has tried right. a whole variety of things. And she is now pretty much carnivore, right? Uh, she has a maximum, I think, of 20 grams of carbs a day. Mm. And she is thriving. And when I say thriving, um. I mean, athletically, cognitively, I don't know anyone who can stay cognitively as sharp for her uh, for as long as she can. Mm. But she and some of her friends have said to me, we feel nervous about even sharing that because these days there's such criticism that she only eats twice a day, sometimes once a day, but yeah. it's mostly um, animal protein, basically. Yeah. So I, I bring that up because... I want this podcast to bring people together. I don't want division, right? I'm I not agree. interested in that. I'm interested in helping people with their health. I so agree. with all that in mind, can you talk to me a little bit through yeah. your lens of how you see animal protein and plant protein? Yeah, it's interesting. Again, like I said, we never, we never saw all this fighting or arguments before. I mean, just like, it, it seems as if it came out of nowhere from my perspective. Um, in terms of the narrative, it's very interesting. The narrative would tell us that eating meat and animal-based proteins, that that's bad somehow. There is no high quality evidence to support that, first of all. And we know that nutrient dense animal foods are incredibly valuable for someone like your mom. It has bioavailable zinc, has bioavailable iron, has bioavailable uh, easily absorbed B vitamins. This is critical. It has creatine in it, it has taurine. Um, and again, if you look at the amino acid composition of say uh, beef or bison or fish or any kind of animal-based product, it is nearly identical to the amino acid composition of our muscles. Plants, have, and again, this is not my opinion. I mean, this is, you can go look at um, a Luke Van Loon's data. He, I was just reading one of his papers where he was talking about plant proteins. It was pretty recent about plant, pr plant proteins and kind of breaking down the essential amino acids. We don't eat for protein. We actually eat for amino acids. It's 20 amino acids that make up the majority of our body. And of those 20, we have nine essentials. The nine essential amino acids 
are what we really need. For example, I mean, we need all of them. And depending on if our body is under stress, we cannot keep up with our essential amino acid intake, like, or um, production, for example, like glutamine. But these essential amino acids are in particular ratios in all foods. And in plant foods, they're much lower. And um, for example, fruits and vegetables, plants are incredibly low or deficient in methionine or wheat or some grains are deficient in lysine. There's, you know, these are just hard, fast biological values. It's not really emotion-based or, um, you know, any of that. So when we think about high quality protein, we have to think, okay, so what are the essential needs that we have? And from my perspective, we really have to think of the branch chain amino acids, because when you prioritize for branch chain amino acids and you prioritize for muscle health, everything else falls into place. Mm. When you go plant-based, can you get all your essential amino acids? You absolutely can. However, it is very difficult to do without processing foods. It's very difficult to do without supplements of pea protein, rice, pea blends. It's very difficult. Can it be done? I'm sure it absolutely can be done. Is that carbohydrate load, which we didn't talk about the carbohydrate threshold, which by the way, um, is 40 to 50 grams max per meal for a sedentary person. Cause that you have to think about glucose disposal over a two hour period of time. So just on that, just so you're saying yeah. basically for a sedentary person who doesn't move much, they cannot process and put away more than 40 to 50 grams of carbs per meal. It's, it's, um, they it's it would be very difficult to do there's a meal threshold you can do it and there's going to be derangement ultimately too high of an insulin stimulation you know it's just not ideal wow um and that's just based on disposal for the brain the liver um the skeletal muscle which actually a rest skeletal muscle is not super active um uh, very you know you have to put in the stimulus so yes so that is a great takeaway for people. You don't want to have a meal that's over really 40 to 50 grams. But anyway, going back to this difference in amino acid quality, can an individual meet all their amino acids plant-based? Yes. They may require 35 or more percentage increase in calories. So 35% more of that food. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I said something about if you calculate the amino acids in quinoa, people were saying, oh, quinoa is a great source of protein. You know, again, um, to we have to understand when we think about protein, we have to understand that it really is about the nine essential amino acids. And that's one of the reasons why people are so confused. But from my perspective, without muscle, we have nothing. Could you eat a sub-threshold meal, sub-threshold diet that is plant-based and um, get in all your amino acids? Yes. Could you eat a sub-threshold meal of animal-based products and get in all your amino acids? Yes. If you do animal-based products, you likely can control for calories. If you do plant-based and are trying to meet that leucine threshold, which, you know, it takes six cups of quinoa to equal one small chicken breast when it comes to that amino acid profile, that's not ideal. I, yeah. I think that, but I do think it can be done. Yeah. Someone yeah. posted that I hurt their feelings by saying this. This is not to hurt anyone's feelings. This is really so that we can have transparent conversations yeah. of what needs to be done. The majority of people don't age well on a purely plant-based diet. So an 80 year old doesn't do well on a purely plant-based diet. It, you know, from a, and this is just my clinical perspective from a geriatrician standpoint, we start, we see lower bone density. We saw all kinds of things. Um, and much lower skeletal muscle mass. So yeah. um, I'm not sure where all the arguments began to, to stem from. I mean, I, I have my perspective, but plant protein makes the correct ratio for plants. Can you combine those plants and, and get enough amino acids? Yes, but we don't just want enough amino acids. We're talking about optimizing. Yeah. So that's yeah. why uh, above one gram per pound ideal body weight is probably you're going to need to go higher if you are more plant-based. Not saying you can't do it. You are going to have to go higher. You do have to account for the carbohydrates. And then the last part is we actually don't know the long-term effects of isolated pea proteins. We are, uh, a lot of people are augmenting processed foods that we don't know what those effects are. They don't exist in nature. Yeah. So many great points uh, you raised there. First thing I want to just clarify, which I thought was really interesting, 
he said, yeah, you probably can get this, the same amino acid profile from combining plant foods. We'll be back to the conversation in just a moment. Now, many of us struggle to find time to eat all of these incredible whole foods. That's why I'm a big fan of good quality whole food supplements like this one that's been in my own life for over three years now. It contains over 75 whole food source ingredients, vitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics, and can help us support our energy, focus, digestion, and our immune system. AG1 are giving my audience a fantastic offer, one year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first order. You can see all details at drinkag1.com forward slash live more, or just click on the link below. And now back to the conversation. But you're going to have to have a lot more calories in order to do that. Now that's really interesting, isn't it? Because it's not as if our populations are in deficit when it comes to calories. Uh, right. so that, there's a problem with how many calories, how much energy yeah. many of us are carrying on our bodies, right? right. So that's the first thing to say, um, which I thought was really interesting. Second thing I want to say is throughout this conversation, I think you've been very passionate, very articulate and very clear. When you gave that 30 to 50 grand recommendation with the first meal yeah. of the day, you said without any prompting from anyone or me, you simply said, look, 30 grams to 50 grams. If you are plant-based, it's probably more towards the 50 grams. Yeah. I thought, this is awesome. This is a practical clinician who's who recognizes that a lot of people are plant-based for a variety yeah. of different uh, reasons, yeah. health, ethics, environment, whatever it might be. And you're just trying to make sure they've got some practical guidance. So I thought that was really nice. Um, and and I, really, I really respect that. The third thing I wanted to say is that I can tell from talking to you that you're a clinician, right? And and that really means a lot to me because as, you know, this this July it's 21 years in clinical practice. I find a lot of people who get stuck in these uh, theoretical discussions. Yeah. have got zero clinical experience. They're yeah. talking about their own health and their own experience, which is yeah. fine. But I I so strongly believe that if you have seen tens of thousands of patients as I yeah. have, as you have, you start to pick up things. You actually start to see, well, actually what works in real life? Busy yeah. people with busy yeah. families, busy lives, what can really work? And so bringing that back to protein, I respect everyone's choice to do what they want Absol to do for them. Absolutely. Right? And there's a lot of flexibility when you're young, you can get away with a lot. And when you have a lot of time and you're incredibly physically active and you're living outside and, and you're doing all these things. And listen, any diet can work for anybody, but my concern is the is also what does it look like when we age? What does it look like when that window of youth has now closed? That's what I'm concerned about is when the decisions that you have made midlife and the decisions that indiv individuals have believed so strongly in that now they are dealing with the consequences of that. Mm -hmm. That is why I am so vocal. That is why we have to protect people so that they can make their own best decision but there is, a, there is a time where that, that window closes and the margin of error becomes much smaller that someone can deal with. And that is where we really have to understand that if we can get protein and skeletal muscle right early on, then we can protect it. Yeah. And I do have concerns about, you know, I, my goal is to educate and I am very vocal about animal-based products because everybody is bashing it and it couldn't be further from this, the truth. Um, listen, when people stop bashing it, I can stop talking about it. Yeah. But until I know that at least we are having transparent conversations, we don't even address food matrix. For yeah. example, what about all the other qualities that are in uh, animal-based products? For, yeah. I mean, for example, um, let's just take whey protein. Whey protein has immunoglobulins. Uh, red meat has... Uh, a whole host of other components other than protein. Yeah. Plants also have these things and it doesn't have to be one way or the other, but we definitely cannot see and say that eating a food that we have been eating for millions of years is the root of everything, the root of all evil. And then to say that plant and animal proteins are equal, I, I, I think that we are going to see an epidemic of osteoporosis, an epidemic of older individuals like we have never seen before yeah. in the next 10 years. The quality of our muscle is the cornerstone for overall health and well-being. 
And quite frankly, it's the organ of longevity. There's nothing more important than skeletal muscle. It is different than this idea of looking good in a bikini and athletic performance, which is, you know, when we think about skeletal muscle, that's often what we think about. I'd love to start with a story about that will really highlight where this came from. I did my fellowship in geriatrics and nutritional sciences. And by the way, as you know, as a physician, geriatrics is over the age of 65. It is end of life. There is palliative care involved. It is nursing home rounds. Quite frankly, it was something that I didn't want to do. But in order for me to have an advanced education in nutritional sciences, it was the deal. I had to make a deal. In order for me to do a two-year clinical fellowship, I had to work as a geriatrician and get my fellowship training in geriatrician and geriatrics. And in the mornings, early morning, I did obesity medicine research. And during the day, I would see patients in the hospital, in the nursing home, in clinics, in memory and aging clinics. And then in the evening, I would go back to doing obesity medicine research. And one of the things that we were looking at was body composition and brain function. And, you know, there's always that one patient, right? I'm sure you've had that one patient that changed everything for you. Any trainer listening will have that one client, any other physician listening, any person will have the influence of one person that really changed the trajectory of their life. And for me, it was a woman named, we'll just call her Betty. She was a mom of three kids in her mid fifties. She had always struggled with the same 20 pounds. We know a ton of people like that. 20 pounds over a lifetime, always put herself last, showed up for her family, showed up for uh, her friends and did exactly what the medical community had told her, which was eat less and exercise more. And quite frankly, I gave her the same advice. We imaged her brain. And her brain looked like the beginning of an Alzheimer's brain in her mid-50s. As you can imagine, it really struck me. It struck me because during the day, aging and Alzheimer's was very real to me. And I was seeing the implications it was having on the family and the friends and and the people around individuals who have cognitive impairment. I realized that she'd done everything we had told her to. And in the process, she lost weight, just as many people lose weight, go through process of yo-yo dieting. But she also lost skeletal muscle and destroyed her metabolism and impacted her brain. So I started thinking, okay, how is this a standard of care? So I started to really begin to put these pieces together. What was the one thing that all these patients had in common in the nursing home, in the hospital rounds, in the dementia unit? It wasn't that they were over fat. It was that they had unhealthy skeletal muscle first and that we had been trying to fix this obesity epidemic for the last 50 years. And all of the things that ride along with obesity, Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease, you name it, hypertension, insulin resistance. These are not diseases of obesity. In fact, these were diseases of skeletal muscle first. Insulin resistance, insulin is a hormone released from the pancreas that moves blood sugar out of the bloodstream into the cells. And I realized, I had this aha moment that in order to get people healthy, and if we really truly cared about longevity, we had to course correct the way in which we were thinking and shift our focus from the pathology of fat to the building, the maintaining, the cultivation of the health of skeletal muscle. And that's really where this concept of muscle-centric medicine came from. And of course, I'm sure you have questions and I am going to talk to you about exactly what skeletal muscle does, why it's an organ system. But I think it's important that everyone put themselves in the framework of understanding that we've had a narrative of constantly focusing on uh, all these other diseases as if they're out there. But truly, these diseases begin in our 30s. It's a powerful story. And yes, 
we all have, I think, as physicians, as healthcare professionals, as personal trainers, we all have that one patient, that one client that started to change things in our brain that made us question some of the things that we've been taught or certainly question some of the ways in which we were practicing. But you mentioned there Alzheimer's in the brain. You also mentioned the importance of skeletal muscle. Now, I think for many people, they're going to go, well, yeah, I get it. Skeletal muscle is important. But what on earth has it got to do with the health of our brain? Yeah, it's a really great question. You originally asked me, why do I believe, why is my working hypothesis that skeletal muscle is the cornerstone for health and wellness? Let's talk about what skeletal muscle does. Number one, it is an organ system. It is an organ system that you have voluntary control over. Quite simply, this means it's the only organ system you can directly do something about with conscious thought. You cannot exercise your liver. You cannot exercise your heart specifically to tell it to beat 135 beats a minute. Maybe if you're Wim Hof, it's possible. But for the rest of us, we're unable to tell our thyroid to produce T4. We are unable to tell other organ systems exactly what to do. Skeletal muscle as an organ system is under direct voluntary control. What does this mean? And what does it do? Skeletal muscle is your metabolic sink. This means that the food that you eat, primarily, let's say you were eating carbohydrates, 80 some percent of carbohydrates are disposed of in skeletal muscle. You hear a lot of people talk about elevated levels of blood glucose, elevated levels of insulin. These are directly related to the health of skeletal muscle. How could a listener visualize this? Think about skeletal muscle as a suitcase. I love to pack for a trip. And let's say I am going on a trip for four days and I pack for 30. Think about your skeletal muscle as that suitcase. So for example, I am way overeating carbohydrates and skeletal muscle only can hold so much carbohydrates in the form of glycogen. If I am not exercising that skeletal muscle or I don't have a lot of it or it's unhealthy, I have nowhere to put that glucose. Eventually, that glucose stays in the bloodstream, goes to other tissues. We see an increase in uh, fatty acid deposition all over the body, not just in skeletal muscle. Over time, skeletal muscle that is not exercised and unhealthy ends up looking like a marbled steak rather than a filet, which is exactly what it should look like. It becomes less efficient at utilizing energy. Skeletal muscle is one of the primary sites for mitochondria. Mitochondria, which I know that you've talked about often is the powerhouses of the cell. It's where we generate energy. Skeletal muscle is a primary site for fatty acid oxidation. People are worried about their cholesterol and they're worried about triglycerides. Skeletal muscle is a primary site for utilization. When we think about metabolism and metabolic regulation, Skeletal muscle is the primary site and it's 40% of our body. This is just one aspect from a metabolic perspective. When you talk about brain function and the health of skeletal muscle, if you do not have healthy skeletal muscle, you do not have a healthy metabolism. The body becomes insulin resistant just as the brain becomes insulin resistant. You know, um, Alzheimer's is often thought of as type three diabetes of the brain which means our metabolic health has a direct impact on our brain function. And we know that the lower the waistline, the smaller the waistline, the less body fat an individual has, the better over time the brain will function. It's just remarkable to think about all of the different things that skeletal muscle influences. Yeah, as we discussed the first time you came on my show about 18 months ago, many of us for years have just thought about it as a physical thing, you know, dumb muscle. It's, you know, a bit more if you want to look big and be a bodybuilder, but otherwise it doesn't really matter. And we very much have undervalued the importance of skeletal muscle. One of the key points we mentioned in our first conversation was that as we get older, 
above the age of 30, unless we're doing something about it, we are losing our skeletal muscle every year, right? We did yeah. cover that in quite a bit of detail the first time round. And Dr. Line, my first book that came out at the end of 2017 set out what I consider to be the most important four pillars of health, food, movement, sleep, and relaxation. And in our first conversation, we covered in detail food, specifically protein, how important that might be for skeletal muscle. We mentioned the kinds of exercise that you recommend. You mentioned, I think, you like HIIT training once to twice a week, strength training three to four times a week, and a good cardio base, for example, walking 10,000 steps a day, something like that. I definitely want to revisit some of these things in this conversation, but two of those pillars, sleep and stress, we didn't really cover. So I wonder if we could start off by talking about the relationship between sleep and skeletal muscle. Most certainly. You know, it's a, it's a very interesting um, tie, sleep and skeletal muscle. And I'm going to highlight some of the emerging research, which I think is quite fascinating. One thing to keep in mind is that the research surrounding skeletal muscle has largely been based on performance, which is why we've truly missed it as a medical profession, which is why the world still thinks about skeletal muscle as this performance organ. And it's so much more than that. It interfaces uh, with, you know, the brain, the other endocrine organs, just everything. And sleep and skeletal muscle is interesting. The, here's what is commonly thought about. When you get good sleep, you will have better recovery. This is a time that growth hormone is released. It allows for optimization of hormones. We do need to get into deep rest. It also is a time where the brain cleans itself. The glial cells of the brain clean itself. We do know that sleep deprivation over time has significant effects on cognition. One night of sleep deprivation can impact muscle protein synthesis by 18%. So it can decrease your ability for your body to create this robust response. And muscle protein synthesis is a physiological process in which amino acids are incorporated into skeletal muscle. It's what we would consider a biomarker of the health of skeletal muscle. It's one of the ways in the literature in which health, you know, skeletal muscle health is measured and also that muscle is doing what it should be doing from a muscle protein synthetic response. Um, skeletal muscle is highly plastic and highly responsive to diet and exercise. When you have suppressed muscle protein synthesis, and 18% is a pretty robust suppression with one night of sleep deprivation, and that I think that this the, the data was four hours or less, impacted the ability for skeletal muscle to respond to, again, muscle protein synthesis. And this could be thought of in the, or under the influence of both amino acid influence or training influence, because those are the two ways in which we stimulate muscle. Now here's the catch. A lot of the military operators will go through periods of time where they have sleep deprivation. And what some of the data suggests is that if you go through a few days of sleep deprivation, one way to counteract the influence of sleep deprivation on skeletal muscle is actually pumping up your exercise, which is completely counterintuitive. You would think that if you have gone through a week of sleep deprivation, you should probably just rest. And in fact, that's not what some of the data suggests. Some of the data suggests that an individual should really kick up their training during that time to protect metabolism and to protect and counterbalance the influence of lack of sleep. Because a whole host of other things. So muscle protein synthesis is just one portion of what muscle does. We know that with lack of sleep, and we see this in shift workers, there is an increase in insulin resistance. There is an increase in blood glucose. All of these things, I believe, to be centered around the influence on skeletal muscle. It's really interesting that... If you don't sleep well, 
you decrease your sensitivity to the stimulus of training the next day, right? You mentioned muscle protein synthesis goes down. And as you say, you could then make the case, well, one shouldn't train. But that that new bit of data there, that's fascinating that actually you sort of insulate yourself from some of those negative effects by training. When I spoke to Professor Matthew Walker on this show a few years ago, I remember one of the things he said to me was, if you're losing weight and you're sleep deprived, then the majority of that weight will come from muscle as opposed to excess body fat. So the whole system, the whole body is connected, right? And that's why I really love these four pillars as a way of looking at everything, including skeletal muscle, is because each one of those four pillars influences the other ones. Yes, it does. You know, we don't exist in this silo. And um, and I'm I'm so glad that we're talking about stress because it's often something that people don't necessarily ask me about, but I, I think that it's a, a critical importance. Sleep definitely influences the way in which our metabolism works. Skeletal muscle has probably the biggest influence, by the way, on our entire homeostasis. If you were to ask me, what did I, what do I believe is most important? Is it food or is it training or is it uh, name something, ice bath, et cetera? I would say the influence of exercise trumps nearly everything because of its influence on all other body systems. That is how impactful training is for people. And when we talk about stress, I'm going to, I'm going to throw a loophole here. When I say stress or you say stress, that could mean, I don't know, the kids are home for Thanksgiving. That could mean I have to go to the DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicles, and I don't know if I have my right paperwork. It could also mean the death of a loved one or the sickness of a family member. We have one word to define various different states or experiences or life um tragedies, you know, on any scale. Nowhere in the human language do we have another word that describes all of these different things. Yeah. And, you know, and I will say the evidence supports that how we imagine and think about stress truly does influence our physiology. Yeah, I think it was a paper I read about if you consider the stress to be adaptive for you as opposed to harmful, it has a different physiological effect, which is absolutely incredible. The way you think about that stressor will determine its effect on you. I have seen this in real time in my patients. And I I have to say it, it's one of the topics that is not discussed, but is probably one of the most critical. When we hear stress, we typically think of, what do you think of when you hear stress? What is the response? I mean, normally it's a negative word, isn't it? Because I think we're talking about this chronic, unrelenting stress that we never switch off from, we never allow ourselves to recuperate from. But of course, not all stress is bad. We need stress to be our best selves, don't we? I think the problem for most of us these days and why stress has such a negative connotation is because, you know, we're no longer having our stress responses activated now and again because there's a wild predator approaching our camp. We're having it activated chronically by the state of our lives, our email inbox, the kids we're having to look after, the elderly parents we're having to care for, the negative comment we saw last time we went online, whatever it might be. These are the multiple stressors that are firing themselves at us. And a lot of the stress researchers would argue that the way your body responds is very, very similar, whether it's a physical stress or a psychological stressor. Yeah. And I would say that I absolutely agree with you. What we hear is stress and then we hear fight or flight. Fight or flight is the stress response that we are all taught about. There's an increase in catecholamines. There's an increase in blood pressure. There's a very sympathetic response. Now, I would also say that that is an initial stress response. And that stress response is a physiological response. There are two other stress responses. There is tendon befriend, which is somewhat of an attunement response. And this is, for example, I have have two very little kids. When I see them in distress, instead of going into fight or flight, I go to tendon befriend. What can I do to make their life better? 
Some people, when they are stressed, rather than go into fight or flight, will turn to reaching out to help people. I would say that that is my initial stress response. This does a few things. It increases serotonin. It increases oxy, um, oxytocin. It allows us to bond. The other stress response, which I see with a lot of individuals, is a courage response. And there was, and the courage response is actually something that can be cultivated. And how is this important? And how does this relate to the health of skeletal muscle? Well, I would love to tie that all back in. And the courage response is something that also can be trained. I'll give you an example. My husband was an elite military operator. He was a Navy SEAL for 10 years. He loves jumping out of planes, which is insane. If I were to get up and jump out of a plane, I am sure that my blood pressure would be 500 over 300. I would be so uh, scared and uh, there would be a whole host of things going through my head and it would certainly be a fight or flight response. My husband getting up ready to jump out of a plane might have a slight bump in blood pressure. He might have a slight increase in some of these catecholamines, but his response is courageous. It is much more facilitating. It is of action. And that is another stress response that we are often not taught about. And there was a a very interesting uh, study that took individuals who were deathly afraid of snakes, put them in an MRI machine, put a very large snake on a conveyor belt that would then move towards an individual's head. I'm freaking out just hearing this. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Right. I would be too. And initially, everybody had a fear response and they were, they were looking at fMRI images. They were also measuring, um, you know, various aspects of their body chemistry. But what happened was the second time the individuals were coached up into what could be considered a courage response. And what they saw was different aspects of the brain lit up and they were mounting. There was evidence that they were mounting a different stress response. And this was one of courage. So this goes back to saying that fight or flight is a response and courage is a choice. And if we can readjust our understanding of stress, humans are very interesting. And I'm going to tie this back into this obesity narrative. Once we hear something over and over and over again, humans believe it to be true. And we believe that that is the framework for understanding, just like with an obesity epidemic that we've been trying to fix for the last 50 years, we focus on the pathology of fat. And I would argue that if we ask the right question, then we'll get the right answer. And I think that that can be translated to stress. I think that we have been taught over and over again that we have this one stress response and we should reduce stress. And it's a fight or flight response. I would say that that is a repeated narrative that we can readdress and make individuals much less, I don't know if the word is fragile, but much more resilient Mm. in the way in which they interpret their environment. And what becomes so important, I know that this is really about medicine and kind of this muscle-centric approach, is that when we do things like train, this does create for some people an initial stress response. We begin to cultivate courage. We begin to cultivate behaviors that allow us to acquire skeletal muscle, which take drive and a different way in which we interface with the world. And I hope that that's not too esoteric, but truly the message that I'm trying to deliver is one of strength. And with that message of strength, I'm going to challenge the way in which we have traditionally thought about medicine, but also challenge the way in which we've thought about mindset. And I believe that stress can be enhancing. And I believe that when we recondition individuals to also believe that, then they can have a different control of their physiology, which will allow them to take massive action. I just love what you just said. I really do. In fact, one of the things I enjoyed the most about your latest book, Forever Strong, was how you covered the psychological aspects of change as well as the physical ones. Because what I'm writing about, the things I think about more, are these mindset issues. Because actually, 
once you've got the foundation of mindset right, I find that those downstream behaviors of food and movement, whatever it might be, information is not enough to make change in your life. You have to take action. So to help you take action after watching this video, I've created a free nutrition guide for you. This contains the five most important practices I've seen in over two decades of seeing patients. They work for you no matter what your dietary preference. There's a step-by-step -step action plan to help you implement those changes in your life. If you want to receive that free guide right now, just click on the link in the description box below are so much easier for people to incorporate into their lives when they have these self-limiting beliefs. It doesn't matter how many podcasts they listen to, how many books they read, they don't take action. So I was going to bring those things up with you during this conversation because I think you give a masterclass in that in Forever Strong. The other thing I just wanted to comment on, you mentioned your husband who was a former Navy SEAL. I think this is a really important point. If he was jumping out of a helicopter 30 years ago, right, I imagine he may have been really, really scared. But by training it, by practicing it, by developing his confidence in it, he's now at a point where he can actually enjoy it, whereas you haven't done that. So you or me, we're going to freak out when that happens. What does that tell us? It tells us that the stressed response or much of it is internal. The same external event is happening with jumping out of a helicopter, but how we interpret it is determining the impacts on our bodies. And how we interpret it depends on our experience, our level of confidence, what we practiced. And again, you can tie that into exercise. You can tie that into muscle. The more you practice exercising, the more you train, you are working out your stress response system and therefore Whatever that stressor is in life that comes before you, you're better able to handle it. I believe that we've been asking the wrong question and trying to solve for the wrong problem. The reality is, is we are not over fat. And people could argue and say, okay, yeah, we are. But actually, we are under muscled. And when we think about insulin resistance, obesity, all these metabolic diseases, even Alzheimer's, right, or dementia, type 3 diabetes of the brain, these diseases, they start in skeletal muscle first. Insulin resistance, glucose disposal, issues with metabolism, the primary site is skeletal muscle. Yet we've been obsessed as a culture, as a society, on just obsessed with obesity. It has been the biggest oversight in medicine to date. You mentioned the term root cause medicine. Yeah. Right. What is the root cause of what is going on with our patients? I think it's a very powerful uh, phrase, one that I think Western medicine has not fully embraced yet, uh, although yeah. I, I, I'm very optimistic. I do think it's changing. On this podcast a lot, we talk about what is the root cause of a variety of different health conditions. And we sometimes yeah. speak about things like chronic inflammation, which of course lies at the heart of all kinds of different conditions. Absolutely. But what I've heard you speak before, and what you're incredibly passionate about, is that skeletal muscle or a lack of skeletal muscle yeah. also is one of those big keystone areas that actually when we don't have enough, it can also lie at the heart of all kinds of different problems, right? Yeah, totally. I mean, think about it. Physical movement is optional now. It Ne the machine, the human machine was designed for physical activity, not just physical activity. I'm not just talking about walking. I'm talking about bouts of high intensity movement, lifting heavy things, really being physically active. And what's happened is because our society is so domesticated, it is no longer a prerequisite to living healthy. And if you think about muscle as the pinnacle, right? The pinnacle of health and wellness, it, it makes up, depending on the person, 40% or more of the individual, right? Of our individual tissue, it is the largest endocrine organ. And yes, skeletal muscle is an endocrine organ, but what's so fascinating is it's now become optional to use it or not. You know, when I think, so I did my training in Jerry, I mean, I did my training in nutritional sciences. So I did seven years of nutritional sciences and I did a fellowship in geriatrics and obesity medicine. 
And what is so profound is that there is an interface between the two. Obesity, sarcopenia, uh, you know, Alzheimer's. And if we can address skeletal muscle early, and we are seeing issues with skeletal muscle in lean, quote, healthy individuals, young populations, because insulin resistance and skeletal muscle, which, you know, insulin resistance is this concept of requiring more insulin to move glucose out of the bloodstream. So glucose is toxic. We need it, but it's toxic. And these issues start, they could easily start a decade before, before we are even seeing abnormalities in the bloodstream, before we are even seeing elevated levels of insulin. And that's an issue. So what's happening is we are missing the mark. These diseases are starting in your 20s and 30s. Yeah. You mentioned a few terms there. Um, sarcopenia, which we're definitely going to get to. Yeah. You also mentioned, though, which I, I want to go here, I think, which is we're seeing issues with skeletal muscle early, right? Yeah. That is, I think that sentence alone leads yeah. to so many thoughts in my mind. First of all, what is skeletal muscle for people yeah. who are not familiar with that term? Of course. And then when you say early, what do you mean? How early are we seeing these things? And how worried, I guess, do we need to be in terms of motivating us to change our behavior? Yeah. And these are fantastic questions. Let's start by thinking about skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is really the tissue that you have voluntary control over. When you think about your biceps or you know, your quadriceps, that it is the muscle you have voluntary control over. As opposed to, let's say, in your smooth gut, muscle. you've yes. got smooth muscle, which, right. you know, you can't control, your food goes, no. you know, through the digestive exactly. tracts. Okay, so when people hear skeletal muscle, yeah. I think a lot of people think of uh, strength training. And um, if I, you know, work out in the gym and lift heavy weights, I will grow bigger muscles. Now, uh, of course, not everyone's going to think of that, but I think a lot of people think of that when they when they hear these terms. Now, I think we've undervalued the importance of strength and skeletal muscle in health, as you do for sure. And when I'm talking to groups of people, one of the things I often say to them is, hey, guys, listen, once you hit the age of 30, right? And yeah. I might crack a joke there sometimes depending uh -huh. on who the audience is, but once you hit the age of 30, yeah. unless you do something about it, you are losing muscle mass every single year. So first yeah. of all, is that consistent with the latest research? And at what age do we start losing this really important commodity in our body, which is skeletal muscle? Yeah, th these are, this is, first of all, thank you so much for providing a platform to talk about it. It is, if we can get this message out there, this will change the world. Now, you said a couple really important things here. Number one, when do we lose it? And I would argue, how do we grow it? How do we maintain its health? From a very young age, your body has the, this potential, potential for muscle growth. You are very anabolic, meaning your capacity to put on muscle really starts very young. When I say very young, I am talking about, you know, I have two very little children. The more active they are, the better that's going to be for their muscle mass potential. Now, it's very important from a young age to train. And people are like, oh, you can't tell kids to train. No, children must be physically active. They were designed to do that. The worst, one of the worst things that we can see is childhood obesity. And the reason is, is because skeletal muscle is definitely affected by obesity. The potency of skeletal muscle to have that hypertrophy mechanism, which we, you were talking about, you go to the gym and you build muscle it becomes blunted, the ability to respond, the ability for the muscle to respond to dietary protein, which is really important for stimulating. It's a, a key, a key component to stimulating skeletal muscle becomes blunted. The age in which an individual begins to lose muscle can really depend on their physical activity. If they have a chronic illness, you pointed out that Low levels of inflammation create all kinds of diseases. Low levels of inflammation impact skeletal muscle. Wow. 
it blunts skeletal muscle activity. And can some of these things arguably be overcome with exercise and diet? Yes, exercise is going to be a much more potent stimulus than diet, which is wild because of the physiological pressure that an individual can put on its tissue. As we age, there's a natural phenomenon that happens, and this is called anabolic resistance. And, and you know, and I say this cautiously because all of the majority of the models that we've been looking at for aging are oftentimes sedentary or only moderately active individuals. We don't have a huge body of evidence to actually see if anabolic resistance can be pushed off for highly, highly active individuals. So I'm going to explain what anabolic resistance is. Anabolic resistance is a decrease in the efficiency of the skeletal muscle to number one, recognize and utilize dietary protein. So the mechanism of actually stimulating the tissue becomes less. Now, that typically happens, gosh, that could happen in your 40s. And what that means is that so if you eat the way that you did in your 20s, and let's say you wake up and you have two eggs in the morning and a piece of toast or maybe a little bit of yogurt, you will be at a sub-threshold protein amount. You'll never stimulate that tissue. That's a problem. And we'll, we'll obviously talk about nutrition. The question of when does this start is very variable on the way in which a person has taken care of themselves up to that point. Inevitably, anabolic resistance does happen, and that makes it much more difficult for individuals to build muscle, to stimulate the tissue. And that really, you know, I believe that can happen at any age. In an aging population, it can happen with destruction of skeletal muscle. You know, as individuals age and they don't take care of skeletal muscle, you get, we've all seen a marbled steak. Well, what do you think happens to our tissue? Mm -hmm. We could be walking around with skeletal muscle that looked like a marbled steak. And that decreases its ability metabolically for glucose disposal. It decreases its contractile potential it decreases its ability or efficiency to turn over and repair. There are all kinds of problems. And again, that can start in your 30s. That can start in your 40s. It depends on your physical activity. And when it begins, it is much more difficult to recover from periods of inactivity than ever before. Yeah, there is just so much there. And I really want this to be an empowering episode. My goal is at the end of this conversation, people understand, man, I need to be looking after my skeletal muscle. I need to be prioritizing that. And we're hopefully gonna go through all kinds of different areas around this topic to persuade people, hopefully inspire them to think, no, no, this is really important. They can do it, they but, can do it. Yeah, and, and that's the first thing you said that really, um, really made me reflect and think was what you said about children. Yeah. And you were talking about if we're not active enough, if we're not stimulating the growth of enough skeletal muscle, then we become less responsive to the protein in our diet. Less responsive in terms of that protein than stimulating muscle growth. Is that a correct uh, summary of what you said in that particular well, area? Um, there's a, a couple things to unpack here. In terms of youth and kids, they are very anabolic. They are anabolic. They don't require a meal threshold of protein. They are primed for activity. They are primed for growth. They are incredibly resilient. Fast forward. So their muscle is not anabolically resistant. They are primed for it. After growth happens, when we're no longer in a prime growth phase, say, you know, we're not growing bigger, we're only growing wider. There is that potential where anabolic resistance, and again, anabolic resistance setting in early is somewhat unlikely, but really in your 30s is 30s and 40s is where I believe anabolic resistance can begin depending on the individual. And what that means is in 
midlife. And by the way, you can overcome anabolic resistance. Mm -hmm. You can definitely overcome anabolic resistance. There is great data that supports that in the literature. Um, and it is not a hopeless kind of experience. So individuals can become anabolic resistance in their 30s and 40s, which for sure can be overcome. So I, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, it does. So let's just go there just for a second. Let's say there's someone at the moment, um, I don't know, in their 30s or 40s who are, who are listening to this. Yeah and are thinking, well, I don't know, I've not really thought about muscle before, but you know, I'm in pretty good shape. I walk regularly. I look after my diet. Uh, I sleep well, you know, and, and they think, well, I don't really have any problems with energy or anything like that. Right. So why should they be concerned about what you just said? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, if a stimulus, an intensive stimulus is not provided, there is a natural trajectory of aging, which we see. As individuals age, we've all seen it in our parents, they get skinnier, they get tinier. We believe that that is the end point, right? I think oftentimes we believe, well, I'm just getting older. I, I don't need to do things that really stress out my muscle, or I don't necessarily need to change my nutrition targeted to skeletal muscle aging. And I would say that is the prime time to execute and implement the strategies that I'm about to tell you. Number one, just because you can't see the changes doesn't mean they're not happening. Individuals should definitely be involved in some kind of high, int high intensity interval training one day a week. You must create flux in that tissue. You must utilize substrates. You want to create a stimulus that changes the metabolism of the muscle, you know, in the moment, right? And that could be easily three bouts of 20 seconds, all out effort, not much, right? It could take you 10 minutes and, you know, three, uh, three bouts of 20 seconds, high intensity training, rest, right? You do about, you rest for three minutes, you do another bout, you can rest for three minutes, incredibly valuable. Walking is wonderful. Walking is just movement. I don't consider it training. The other thing that we have to understand is strength decreases as we age. An individual should definitely be doing strength training three to four days a week just to begin to build a foundation. Hopefully we started earlier, but if you didn't, the body is incredibly resilient and it wants to have muscle. It's not like it doesn't want to. We it is part of our makeup. It is mandatory for us. You know, it's, there's very few things in medicine that we can say 100% of the time improve outcome and survivability. The more muscle mass, the healthy, I don't want to say the more, the healthier your muscle mass is, the greater your survivability across all disease states, nearly all disease states, cancer, cardiovascular disease, dementia. These are really big challenges for people, every single one of those challenges can be improved upon by being fit. Uh, also, low intensity training uh, for mitochondria is really important. You know, there's a huge push for resistance exercise, which is a non-negotiable. There's also value for doing cardiovascular training. It improves mitochondria. It um, really helps overall wellness. And a lot of the data for muscle as this endocrine organ, which it is, when you contract skeletal muscle, it secretes myokines. Myokines go throughout the body. The, the most studied myokine is, is interleukin-6. Yeah. This is interesting because interleukin-6, people think about as a cytokine released from cells of the immune system, which create a pro-inflammatory state. But exercise is also skeletal muscle, what it secretes. This is an immune regulatory organ. Skeletal muscle is not just about fitness. It's not just about managing blood sugar. It is an immune modulatory organ. It interfaces with the immune system. So when you do cardiovascular activity, interleukin-6 can increase a hundredfold. And it actually has a different effect on the body and can help counterbalance the inflammatory mechanisms in the body. Uh, that is profound. Yeah, it's it's so fascinating it really speaks to how the body really is one 
big interconnected system. Nothing works in isolation because you've already I, so far mentioned how um, better skeletal muscle will help you with longevity, Alzheimer's, um, type 2 diabetes, immune system function. We're going to get into hormones later on. We're going to talk about all these things, but it's amazing how one thing can impact so many different systems of the body. And I think this again really speaks to this point, Gabrielle, that I think we've thought muscle is just dumb muscle. It's just like a physical Always. thing that we can Always. see. We, we don't realize actually, you know, this is, a, this is an active organ. Right? It's, it's an a, endocrine organ. Yes, yeah. it's an endocrine organ. It's, it is it's, not just about being jacked and tan. Like, yeah, and we also, I think there's a, yeah. in society, we think about it for teenagers and people in their 20s, you know, they want to look yes. buff, they want to look good, right? So they're yeah. the ones lifting weights. But I've come to the understanding over my career that actually it's more important, the older you get, right? It's actually more important than I'm not saying it's not important as a teenager. I'm just saying it, but it actually goes up in importance. Now, before we tackle that, you mentioned three very practical things there that I think will be really interesting to people. So can we just dive into those a little bit just to get some clarification? So the first thing you mentioned is once a week, do some form of high intensity interval training. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to clarify this because a lot of people, when they think of skeletal muscle, they're thinking about lifting weights whether it be in the gym or at home yeah. to work on their strength. Yet when you're doing HIIT training, like let's say people do these 20 second sprints all out, they rest for two, three minutes and they repeat yeah. three times, which can be done in under 10 minutes, which is very, very practical for people. What is that doing to their skeletal muscle? Yeah, well, one of the things that it does is it's a very well documented in the literature that it is really the primary driver to, as it relates to exercise that improves insulin resistance. So it's one modality to improve insulin resistance and mechanistically how it works. Um, I'll just mention that it improves. It's called GLUT4, GLUT4, yeah. GLUT4 transport of glucose into, skel into skeletal muscle. And that is incredibly valuable in terms of really putting in the effort. We know that you can lower insulin resistance through irrespective of actually diet through just leveraging skeletal muscle. That's incredible. Yeah, that is incredible. And so obviously different people of different fitness mm -hmm. levels will listen to this show, right? So yeah. someone is gonna go, like for me, I'm like, okay, bro, I'm doing that once a week. I'm gonna do that sprinting. I love things like that. But for someone, let's say a bit more immobile or a bit older yes. who thinks I can't go all out, is it a relative perception? Yes. So can they do speed walking or run as fast as they can? As yes. are, are you looking basically for a contrast between, you know, high speed movement and then low speed? I mean, what is it we're looking at? Absolutely. Here? That's exactly right. And for some people, it might be sitting up, sitting from a chair to standing. Yeah. It is about the personal induced adaptation. Yeah. Love that. It is very that. personal. Um, and as a person gets more fit, they can do more. Yeah. It doesn't have to be rowing as fast as you can or, you know, sprinting. But it really is exactly what you said. It's putting in effort, pulling back, putting in really intensive effort. Obviously, they need to talk with their physician. We're not telling anyone to go out and do this without the guidance of um, someone else or a professional that they, they use. But yes, it yeah. is really about exercise the goal of exercise is inducing adaptation the reality is i believe that the body is designed to do these things and you know um i also believe that we have softened ourselves as a society and yeah. one of the reasons why muscle health is not at the forefront is because it's not easy the 30 second bouts resistance training all of these things take incredible discipline I have been a physician since 2006, and I will tell you, I have seen what makes individuals successful. And if you allow me, I would love to share some of the aspects that I have seen that really change the narrative for people. And every single person listening to this podcast will be able to take what mm -hmm. I am saying and implement it immediately. Yeah, please. Okay. I'm going to tell a quick story time. We have plenty of time. I have one entrepreneur 
who hosts a massive event in Las Vegas every year. Thousands of people. And every year, I wait for the call. The call that comes after the big event. And that call is, I am depressed. I'm not motivated to train. By the way, he's super fit. I am eating junk food. And I just, I know you want to see people. I just want to, to lay in bed. And every year, he's shocked by this. He is shocked by his own human nature. And you're thinking, okay, so let's break this down. Everybody's striving to do things, whether you are mom trying to get your kids to a big event, or you are a business owner, or you are a doctor, or you are a writer. Everybody has some level of thing that they are working towards. And once you are at that pinnacle, right? So let's say when your next book comes out, you will be spending months and months and months prepping for this thing. And then you will be at the top of the world. You have this high level of dopamine drive and obviously other neurotransmitters, but we'll just relate it to dopamine. And at that peak, at the pinnacle of success is where people are most vulnerable. And right after they reach their most successful moment is their second point of vulnerability. I am going to circle back how this all relates to mindset and what these individuals listening, guys out there listening, guys and girls out there listening, what you can do. As high as an individual is going to go is as low as they are going to go. It is predictable and it is human nature. The best of the best are very neutral and they practice neutrality and they practice ways of dopamine preservation. If we think about the neurotransmitter dopamine related to drive and motivation, again, to say it simply, when you have a big event, this is your place of vulnerability. You will look for the next car to buy, the next thing to do, the next food to eat, the next thing to buy at the peak of your success. There is nothing that will take you off track faster than not understanding this. As high as an individual is going to go is equally as low as they were going to go. I did this massive push here for the book Forever Strong. How pumped up do you think I allowed myself to get before the day before the book release? I would imagine extremely pumped up. Extremely neutral. Here's why. Because I knew that as high as I was going to get with this book release would be as low as I would go. You hear people that go off and do some kind of physical event, following that physical event, whether it's running a marathon or taking a test or doing the thing that they had trained to do, become extremely depressed afterwards. Have you heard that? I have heard it. I've experienced it myself. And I'm delighted to hear that you have presumably gone through a process to get to this point where you're able to maintain neutrality even the day before your very first book launch, which for many people is a hugely exciting moment. But I totally agree with you. I've had it before when I wasn't emotionally neutral and I'd have the highs and lows. And for the last few years, I say the last two or three years, I feel generally pretty neutral a lot of the time. It doesn't mean I don't enjoy life. I, I enjoy life more now than I ever have right. because of that neutrality. People will often say, yeah, but I want the highs. You know, I don't mind the lows, but without the lows, I don't get the highs. You can have it just not with that same amplitude and it's much more sustainable. For me, Dr. Lyon, a lot of that is coming from, I guess, the sort of things we were talking about related to your husband jumping out of a helicopter. It's come from the fact that I understand deeply that a huge part of my response is down to me. And I've worked very hard and cultivated this skill. I don't think it's something you're necessarily born with. I think it's something you can get better at. One of the ways I've done it is by looking at every day as a school day. So every time for the last years when I would get emotionally triggered by the thoughts or the words or actions of somebody else, instead of thinking they were the problem, I would reflect it back onto me and go, why is this bothering you, Rongan? Do you expect to walk around the world and expect everyone to say the things that you want to hear? No, that's completely unrealistic. So therefore, I can't control other people's words 
and behavior and actions, but I can control my response. And so by doing this as a diligent daily practice, I've now got to the point where a lot of that is default. And bringing it back to health for people tuning in who want to have more vitality, they want to live longer, they want more energy, they want to lose weight, whatever it might be, I, like you, Dr. Lyon, believe that this is one of the most important skills because if you can maintain that neutrality, just taking a quick break to give a shout out to Vivo Barefoot Shoes. Now, I've been a huge fan of Vivo Barefoots for over 10 years now, well before they started supporting my podcast. They are the only shoes that I wear and they really have had a huge impact on my own life and the lives of many of my patients. You see, when people start wearing minimalist shoes like Vivos, you can see improvements in things like back pain, hip pain, knee pain, foot pain, even things like plantar fasciitis can often get better. And scientific research shows us that just wearing Vivos for about four months or so improves the strength in your feet by over 60%, which is absolutely incredible. One thing people don't realize about these shoes is just how flexible they are which allows your feet to do what your feet naturally want to do rather than the shoe dictating your foot's movement. Vivo Barefoot are giving my audience a 15% off one-time code when you make your first order and they make it really easy for you to give them a try. They give a 100-day trial for new customers. So if you don't like them, you just send them back for a full refund. I'm a huge fan. I really hope you take advantage of this offer. To get your 15% off codes, all you need to do is go to vivobarefoot.com forward slash live more or click on the link in the description box below. It's easy not to go to the alcohol. It's easy to not comfort eat the sugar or the ice cream because those things are, in my experience anyway, they are usually downstream consequences of these kind of upstream patterns. It's so brilliantly stated. And I will say congratulations because the best of the best have that level of neutrality. Again, I take care of patients that are the best in the world at what they do. They do exhibit that neutrality and it is something that they have learned over time. And by doing that, they don't have the highs and lows. And it's exactly what you're saying. It's not that you are not excited about something, but it is a moderated excitement. And I can give individuals very practical tools, which we're going to talk about right now, what they can do to begin to build that neutrality muscle over time. Exactly what you said. So you are able to think of every day as a school day, which is genius, and begin to think about what are some of the things that may be a negative experience. For example, for you, maybe it's comments. You're very much in the public eye. That does take time to kind of build up that neutrality. Here's a couple of very simple things that people could do for dopamine preservation. We'll just, we'll identify it as dopamine preservation. Go through your week and don't celebrate every win. I am not talking about not being kind to yourself. I'm not talking about belittling yourself. I am just saying that don't celebrate every win. Intermittently celebrate a win of doing something great. Flip a coin. You flip a coin, heads you celebrate, tails you don't. If you are an individual who loves loud music and some kind of stimulant before you go to work out, whether it's caffeine, et cetera, flip a coin. One day have it, the other day don't, and you don't know which day that's going to be. You begin to build up these muscles of dopamine preservation. Let's say you want to go shopping and you can afford to buy something, you flip the coin, whether you get it or you don't. And over time, you begin to then translate that to these big events and things that people are doing. Again, little things will then translate to big things because it is about the long term, the way in which we want to show up for our family, for our work. It is a long-term game. And the highs and lows make people very vulnerable to human nature in a way where the habits that they create the habits that you create in your 30s, 40s, and 50s become much more difficult to break each defining decade. So if someone is listening, really begin to initiate some of these practices and you can begin to change your habits very, very quickly. And it won't be a habit that you have to deal with emotional eating in your 50s. 
And that, that's just one aspect that I think is extremely beneficial. The other thing is people talk a lot about positivity and they think, I'm going to do this exercise and diet program because I'm going to lose weight X, Y, and Z. I would say that that is not an effective strategy. What is an effective strategy is if you can collapse your future self with your current self. And let's just say caring what people think. If you care what people think and that consumes your mind, imagine the cost of that behavior and that thought process if you do it for a year. And then if you do it for five years and then you do it for 10 years, imagine the cost on your life. You could do that for diet and exercise. Let's say you have kids and Friday night, you've done great all week and you sabotage yourself every Friday night because that's how you relax. Imagine what that toll is going to be if you continue to do those habits over a year. Each time you repeat a habit, you are much more likely to repeat that habit again. So when you collapse your future self with your current self, and yes, it does have a bit of a negative spin, but it's kind of like, what was that that movie, um, that that Christmas movie with the three angels? Do you remember? What Gareth's it was, right? in the background. He's saying it's a it's a wonderful life. It's a wonderful life. That is an example. If someone wants to see what I am talking about, watch It's a Wonderful Life. It will snap you out of whatever you are telling yourself instantaneously. Yeah, you do. You do. You have to collapse that future self with the current self. I think what we're talking about here. It's so, so important and so, so undervalued generally in the health conversation that takes place everywhere these days. It's all about more information. And look, I'm all for giving people information. And in our first conversation together, you gave a masterclass in protein and resistance training. And hopefully we can cover some of those things again today. But I think people, even with that information, don't always manage to make change. So let's imagine a scenario, and given the time of year, it's January, and someone is thinking, this year something is going to be different. You know what? I'm getting my stuff sorted in 2024. And in my view, if you don't take a different approach, why is it that 2024 is going to be any different than 2023 or 2022 or 2021. So instead of trying to buy a new book or a new diet plan or a new strength program, whatever it might be, sure, do that. But you need to go a little bit further upstream as well. So can you relate what we're talking about now to people wanting to create healthy behaviors? I have a great solution for this. Are you ready? The solution is we set standards. We don't set goals. Standards for how we show up, standards for how we execute. You no longer need to set goals. If you have a weight loss goal, this sets you up for failure. The first thing that people should do is set a standard for how they want to show up. For me, I show up, I train. It is a standard that I have set for myself. I eat a certain kind of whey, a certain amount of protein, a certain kind of carbohydrate. It's a standard. It is not a goal. And when we shift away from goals, because goals are variable and you have an opportunity to meet that goal or you have an opportunity to fail at that goal. But when you set a standard for the way in which you function in your everyday life, and I encourage people to write it down. Yeah. What is the standard that you are going to set for yourself and then execute on that standard? An individual will find that everything else falls into place. It's really interesting because you're saying set a standard, right? Say what you're going to do and do it. You know, be accountable. In fact, there's a section in your book, I think, called Erecting Guardrails for Accountability, which I really enjoyed. And something you said in that section was, you need to know what integrity is and what your responsibilities are to yourself. That was really, really powerful for me. What do you mean integrity and your responsibilities to yourself? Nothing will under, undermine how you feel about yourself if you have standards that you set and that you don't keep. And for me, you know, there was a period of time 
where I was all over the place. I was training a lot, many hours of the day, and it was taking away from the things that I needed to do. And, you know, that might be the opposite problem some people have, but it wasn't being truthful to the integrity that I had set for myself. For me, training an hour a day is plenty. Anything above that is me running from whatever it is that I'm supposed to be doing because I'm, quote, training and I'm doing something healthy. When you set a promise to yourself, whether it is you're going to eat a certain nutrition plan, and I don't care actually, quite frankly, what plan that is. You can define it, which you should, exactly what you are going to do. If you are comfortable having a drink on the weekends, that gets written out. You define what it is that you are going to be doing. That is your plan. You make a promise to yourself that you're going to keep that plan. And every single time that you don't, you come out of alignment. And what is the best effective way to put something back into alignment? I mean, from my experience, it's a consequence. You have to have a consequence for your action. If a consequence is big enough, it it makes you reevaluate what it is that you're doing. If a consequence is big enough and it allows you, you know, it's like with a little kid, if you change their focus, they'll forget why they're angry. And it's not that the thing that they were angry about was a, you know, was an important thing. Maybe I didn't scramble the eggs in an appropriate way, right? You're laughing because you have kids and maybe yeah. <laughs> the eggs got thrown in my face and then I show them uh, some new handwriting book that I got them. And all of a sudden, this is the thing. So it's very rarely that it's a thing. And what I appreciate so much, and I'm so thrilled that you're a physician talking to me about this, is that I could give someone the perfect program. I could say, we must exercise our skeletal muscle. 50% of people don't exercise. Maybe 24% of people are even meeting that daily recommendation. By telling people to do the thing or increase dietary protein, none of that matters. It's not going to happen. If the brain chemistry and the initial framework for understanding is not addressed, then an individual will never see success. I completely agree. Gabrielle, when you were mentioning your commitment to yourself, I think you mentioned it was one hour of training per day. Mm -hmm. And you said, I believe, anything more than that is too much and is you trying to in some ways, run away from the more important things in your life. Now, I think that is such a key, key point. Many people will do this. Many people will not have the awareness that they're doing this. And I want to tie this into this broader concept, which is I think people take on too much, particularly at times like January, where they think, right, I'm going to overhaul everything. I'm going to eat fantastically well. I'm going to I'm going to do Dr. Lyons' plan. I'm going to strength train four times a week. I'm doing 10,000 steps a day. I'm doing HIIT training twice a week. And they do it for two or three weeks when the motivation's high. And then real life gets in the way and they fall off. So when mm -hmm. I hear you saying that your commitment to yourself is one hour of training per day, no more than that, I think it's, it's really, really powerful. You seem to have found what works for you. It doesn't mean that's going to work for someone else. That's what works for you in the context of your life. And there was mm -hmm. a section in your book when you're talking about mindset and overcoming resistance, where you said, you admitted to previous thought loops that you had. And you said this, my thought loops told me I would never be fit enough, which drove me to train for hours per day whilst neglecting the other aspects of my life. Can you speak to that a little bit, please? I think it's really important that we understand. Um, I will say this first, that motivation comes and goes, and you have to plan for that. You cannot be shocked by the fact that you will not be motivated. I was able to address all of that stuff many years ago. There are many times now I do not feel like training. I have two very little children. My husband is a first-year surgical resident, which means... He works 100 hours a week. Here's what I do. I am not surprised by the fact that I am not motivated to train. What I do is I have it all set up. For example, I have training partners that I know are going to be meeting me at the gym. I am not going to let them down. 
I would never not say I'm going to show up for something and then not show up for it. I know that when I get off of a plane, I will go and I'll train. I don't feel like it. I'm already trying to, every Saturday we do this, or every Sunday we do this big group workout. Every Saturday night, I am trying to talk myself out of how I'm not going to be going and showing up for Sunday. Yet we're all surprised that we're going to start on a program January 1st, and then we're shocked by the fact that we're not motivated by t- in two or three weeks. Plan for that. You're not going to feel motivated. You are going to feel motivated the first week. Failure to understand and plan for the fact that is absolutely going to fall off is a complete misstep. You plan for that. You have your teammates in place that you are going to show up for because if you're not willing to do it for yourself, you will definitely show up to do it for another person. And yeah, that's all I can say about that. I am definitely not motivated a lot of the time, but I still will show up. I think relating also to your one hour a day of commitment to training, I think is this idea that there's a cost to everything we do. There's a consequence to everything. So in the modern world and the way we're living these days, many people feel time pressured all the time. And then they will hear, let's say you on your first podcast with me, you gave some recommendations that some people are going to find very tricky to fit into their life. Your advice was that most people need a good cardio aerobic base. That could be with 10,000 steps of walking a day. You thought they need some form of high intensity training, maybe once to twice a week, and some form of resistance strength training, ideally three to four times per week. Now, for some people, they're going to go, no chance. There's no way I can do that. Let's push back on that. And let's say that you truly don't have time. There are ways to make it happen. And let's say, realistically, you might not have an hour a day. You can get in there. Then maybe you're an individual who needs to do more high-intensity interval training. And that could be accomplished in 20 minutes. There is a baseline physical activity that you must meet. You must be out and moving. We are not designed to be sedentary. And we must rethink this domestication of humanity. I'm with you. Like for most of my life, until the last two or three years, I would say I prioritized intensity, right? So for a variety of reasons, um, throughout my adult life, I feel I've been under huge amounts of stress. There's that word stress again. Um, Now, I would always move my body. So listeners of this show will know that I do a five-minute strength workout every morning whilst my coffee is brewing. Now, you may argue that five minutes is not enough. I'll take it. But I would say I keep in pretty good shape from doing that now. Over the last two years, things have changed. As I have got older and I look in detail at the research on movement and exercise, I'm like, hey, wrong and listen, if you want to be a capable, strong, resilient human being, you've got to move your body. So I am now committing to one hour's movement a day, right? And I love these daily things because if it's daily, it's a habit. Now, it doesn't mean I'm going to run every day, right? Some days it will be a one hour fast walk. Other times it will be a run or whatever it might be. But by making it a rule, by making it a standard that I'm accountable to myself. And I want to tie that in to this time of year, right? Even if people just commit to one thing and they do it, I think that is the best thing you can do. You give yourself evidence that you do what you say you're going to do. You are onto something, my friend. And what you're also onto is shifting a narrative and a way of thinking of how we have to age. Does this take time commitment? Does it take physical effort? Is it sometimes uncomfortable because the last thing you want to be doing is push-ups and squats in your kitchen? Yeah, it's a drag, potentially. But the outcome is so beneficial when you are leveraging this organ of longevity from a lifetime trajectory of It's like putting money in the bank. 
You are doing what you need to do. It's an organ system. It is an organ system designed for movement. Yeah. When you are sedentary, your muscle becomes insulin resistant. When, you know, it goes back to this analogy of the suitcase of going on a trip for four days, but packing for 30, you are creating flux within your skeletal muscle. The other thing that you are doing that one must recognize is that skeletal muscle is currency, but it is the only currency that cannot be bought, cannot be sold. It cannot be traded for. Skeletal muscle is a currency that must be earned and you are earning it daily. And through that process, you are becoming a certain type of person, someone who is physically strong, someone who is mentally disciplined. You are becoming a certain person capable of having skeletal muscle. And the two are not different. Yeah. In that chapter, I think it's chapter nine, you say, don't think of training as an activity with health benefits. Instead, consider it as a baseline requirement for wellness and an essential component of maintaining health and protecting longevity. If we're talking about society and how society has changed so that many of us now are over fat and under muscled. Yes. A lot of people, and I would say, Again, I'm not a woman, uh, but from what I can gather, a lot of women are fearful of strength training because cosmetically they don't want to have hypertrophy. They don't want to put on muscle and look really, really muscly. Yeah. Now, I have to bring it up because I think some people will be thinking that. And that's very difficult. And I also want to correct myself. So I think about it in terms of hypertrophy, but it's not because I think about it in terms of hypertrophy by how we look. Okay. And I think that that's really important because the last thing that I, I want to do is, okay, well, now I got to do, you know, I'm happy with how I'm looking. I'm fine. I don't want to go do resistance exercise. The reason I think about hypertrophy is we have to think about skeletal muscle as, again, body armor, as the amino acid reservoir, as a site for lipid oxidation. You know, everyone cares about lipids, fatty acids, as a site for glucose disposal, it's not enough to just do kind of the bare minimum. And the reason goes back to that anabolic resistance and that trajectory of aging. Skeletal muscle, you know, it's, it can be the first thing to go because it is the amino acid reservoir, the body in need will take from skeletal muscle. And that becomes really important to understand. And yes, we also have to talk about mobility and functionality and activities of daily life. And, you know, the wider the waistline, the lower the brain volume can be. Yeah. It, it you know, so I, I would hate for someone to say, oh, well, it's resistance exercise. It's just for hypertrophy. Yes, but not for the hypertrophy as it relates to bikini. Yeah, that's important. But really the metabolic, the medicine that muscle provides us. Yeah, that's beautiful. The, the medicine that muscle provides us, that's. That's what we need to start thinking about when we think about muscle. It's medicine for the body. And as you say, and as a lot of the research points to, mm -hmm. after the age of 30, unless we do something, it starts to decline. Yeah. And it can be rapid. It, it, it depends rapid. on the person. So for example, let's say someone got sick and, and they were in bed. Their strength, their strength within two weeks is going to exponentially decline. Yeah. Strength muscle size, all these things happen very quickly. Well, you said body armor. I thought that was a really evocative term. Yeah. And it made me think of resilience because I thought, and I don't know what your view on this would be, but as, as you said that, I thought, yeah, the more body armor you've got on you, then you become more resilient to 100%. whatever may happen, like unpredictable things that you don't know might be around the corner, whether it's- Which a, always happen. Which happen, yeah, a crash or you get injured or you get knocked Absolutely. over or whatever might happen. Your body armor at that point may, I guess, reduce your risk of injury, number one. Yes. And two, if you do yes. get injured, may you know, enhance the speed of your recovery. So is resilience a way that we can look at muscle as well? Absolutely. And what you said is absolutely correct. I, I remember um, I had a patient and this patient was, he was a cyclist 
And he was always really into uh, weight training, which is unusual for a cyclist. He was very physically fit. He got into a horrific, horrific car accident. It took him a year and a half to recover, to come back. He had to learn how to walk again. And the doctor said the thing that saved him was the amount of muscle that he had on him. It not only saved him in the actual injury, but it saved him in the way that his body, again, he lost a lot of blood. He had, his body went into a very, very chaotic, highly catabolic state. And the fact that he had muscle, they believe was the reason he survived. Yeah, so this then enhances the muscle as medicine Mm -hmm. argument even further. This is muscle being life-saving. Yeah. I mean, that's effectively what you just said. Having muscle, having good quality skeletal muscle on him potentially either solely or certainly contributed hugely to his life being saved. Now that is huge, right? A young fit cyclist having his life saved purely because of the amount of muscle. And Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to keep hammering home this point, but I am very passionate like you that we've undervalued muscle. And if we don't do something about it, we're gonna be losing it. So your second recommendation was three to four times a week resistance training. Now, let's just unpick that a little bit. On an evolutionary level, of course, you know, our hunter-gatherer ancestors didn't, you know, have these 30, 40 minute set periods, three to four times a week where they would work on their strength. Their lives were their gym, right? So they were always lifting heavy things, doing stuff. So for example, let's say someone listening to this is active. They move around, they're gardening a lot, they walk to the supermarket, they, um, You know, they buy their shopping and they lift and they, you know, and they literally walk home. Let's say they walk home for a mile, lifting three bags of shopping in each arm. I know it's not common these days. I certainly, I do see it in the UK. I very rarely see it in America, if I'm honest, um, because of the car focus of culture that I've certainly seen when I'm ever in America. Um, For someone like that, who is pretty active and is lifting things, Is it fair to say that they may be okay without some sort of dedicated resistance training? I know it's hard to say. say, Yeah, I would say no. And let's think about that. Where is, if we fast forward 10 years, what is that going to look like? So they have not, if they are doing the same thing that they did and they do it for another 10 years, are they actually creating a stimulus for growth? Mm. No, they're doing the same thing. Their muscle is accustomed to that. Listen, it's better than nothing, but I would argue that that's baseline. I don't even consider that exercise. Right. I consider that movement and activity. And the reason is, is we always have to think about challenge. You mentioned resilience. Without those kinds of things, the body has a natural propensity to atrophy. And, you know, I think about this daily as in my own training, I'm thinking, okay, well, what am I doing that is actually challenging me? And what is going, you know, what do I want to do for the next decade? If, and and, and you see this in the gym for individuals that have always done the same thing, they don't progress. The idea in life in all domains, whether it is your work or your family is growth. And I know that this sounds esoteric and now I'm translating personal growth to muscular growth, but it takes a certain mindset and discipline to push the body to a level that is a bit uncomfortable. And I believe that pushing the body to a level that is somewhat uncomfortable really creates a capacity to age well. So no, I don't believe carrying groceries and doing things that would constitute an active life cycle, uh, acted, an active life is enough. Those individuals, I believe, and they don't have to go into the gym, they could use kettlebells. And it's very easy initially to put on muscle mass. Um, and you could, and it's also pretty easy to maintain muscle mass. I could go to the gym and I could do five sets per muscle group a week, and I could probably maintain my muscle mass. But for muscle hypertrophy, again, it depends on the, the age of the trained individual. And I'm sure that you've got a lot of Uh, fitness professionals on here and they uh, have seen it. They may uh, agree or disagree, but I I really follow the work of a a PhD named Dr. Andy Gelpin, and he gives great recommendations for progression of hypertrophy. It is absolutely necessary 
And when we think about hypertrophy and we just think about resistance exercise, you know, you do have to go through a period of growth and that could be 10 to 20 uh, sets per muscle group. That's a huge volume. Yeah. You don't have to start there, but you know, again, everyone responds differently. You do have to get to the point where I believe that you are tracking your growth and that you are doing things that are challenging you. And I'm going to, and I'm going to say this and people might not agree, but I think you should have at least one to two workouts. You do not want to do a week. They really kind of suck because they're really hard. Yeah. One thing I really appreciate about you, Gabrielle, is your passion and your desire to really speak truth as you see it and as you have seen your patients. Yeah. A lot of us these days, especially because of cancel culture, you know, hold back a little bit sometimes because, you know, we know how easy it is to end up saying something that results in people getting triggered about stuff, but you very clearly there said something which a lot of people may not like to hear, but yeah. in your many years of clinical experience, the thousands <laughs> of patients you've come across and, yes. and treated, you're saying you need to do one or two workouts a week that you don't want to do, i.e. they're uncomfortable. That suck, where you do not want to do it, I do it. Yeah. Now this is going against, again, the societal narrative, right? You mentioned a few things there which I really think are worth just highlighting because society now is again it depends on who you are but much of western society at least is yeah. relatively easy in the sense that we don't need to move our bodies in order to acquire food in order to go to work in order to you know order a takeaway or whatever you just do it on your app now on your phone right mm -hmm. it's, it's getting easier and easier so therefore what you know what traditional populations have is their lives were a bit inconvenient. They had to move their bodies in order to just do the basics of everyday living, whereas we don't have to do that now. So in this day and age, presumably there are certain personality types. I, and I'm interested, is, if, have you noticed yeah. this in your practice? Presumably yeah. there are certain types of people who can thrive in this environment, but many people just struggle because they're doing what everyone around them is doing, but what everyone around them is doing is frankly suboptimal, which is why we're struggling so much as a population. Yes, are you ready for something else that I think might be a very unpopular opinion? We have created a narrative in our culture that stress is bad hmm. and that fight or flight is what stress is. But what if I told you that there are other stress responses and often much more cultivated responses like the courage response, like the tend and befriend response and individuals that can mount those responses, which I believe is actually the default, but yet we've been told that stress is bad and um, discomfort is bad, is doing nothing other than completely devaluing what the human spirit was designed to thrive on, which is challenge. So do I believe that individuals need to push hard? Yes. And I also believe that there is a pervasive discussion that softens us physically and mentally, you know, and as a physician, I'm, I'm very concerned about the physical softening that I've seen in um, my clinic and, and my practice. I've been practicing medicine since 2006. And I will tell you those individuals that do the best over time, really understand and leverage what the potential is for discomfort and embrace it mm -hmm. and lean into it rather than turn away from it. And ultimately, it augments the way in which the physiology responses, the way in which the physiology responds. And that is profound. Yeah. You're a mother of two young kids. I am. With everything that you know, Yeah. and I appreciate they're super young at the moment. <laughs> super, super young. Super young. Like my kids now are 12 and 9. So yeah. You know, I'm pretty, I hope not full on, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty proactive with their health. Let's yeah. put it like that. You know, I had monkey bars put up in the garden. I, may, I used to get them. Guys, yeah. you've got to be able to do monkey bars. You've got to, you know, we, we, we are pretty active as a family. Now, not as active as I would like some of the time with the kids, particularly, you know, my son started high school now or secondary school. Um, and I can see as 
certain yeah. pressures come on with academic subjects, man, you can just see how physical activity starts to go down totally. dramatically, which is why at the weekends, we really focus on moving. So, you know, my son and I will do a 5K run Amazing. every Saturday morning as part of something called Park Run. It's just, it's not negotiable. It's not, it, no one's putting a gun to each other's head. It's just something we do together. It's just a normal part. So what is a 5K run doing? So this is, you know, I don't know, 22, 23, 25 minutes of moving our bodies, getting our heart pumping. How does that fit into your uh, model of what we should be doing for skeletal muscle? I think that that's fantastic. And I also believe it's a non-negotiable. So what you're talking about is some cardiovascular and a bit of endurance activity. That is wonderful for mitochondria. It is also wonderful for movement. It's wonderful for cardiovascular health. You know, and I typically recommend at least 150 minutes of that a week. Yeah. So I guess what I was getting to is, have you got in your mind an idea of what you're planning to do with your children as they get older? Because as a parent of 12 years, my experience is society is working against you in order yeah. to stay healthy, in order to keep your kids healthy. Yeah. You simply cannot do what everyone around you is doing because I just think it is so suboptimal, unfortunately. I agree with you. And luckily, um, I think that that's where setting a family culture is really important. Uh, we are an incredibly physically active family. We're already physically active. Mm. And even with the almost three-year-olds, we, um, you know, and, and I suppose that we do have a, a little bit of an advantage because my husband is a former military. I'll give you an example. This on Father's Day just happened. We went over to the monkey bars and we did a pretend obstacle course. Yeah, you know, um, we do push ups and we do sit ups and we do that and we make it fun and we do it every day just for fun. Yeah. We are early on in training them. Um, my daughter has just started into martial arts. It will never be an option for them. Obviously, uh, it will be up to them. But in terms of the culture of the family, yeah. I just know how important it is as they are young. Um, while their satellite cells are turning over, it's easy to build and maintain muscle and to be really fit. I'd much rather have them focus on that now than suffer later. Yeah. Because at some point, if it's not addressed, it creates a whole host of problems that are, you know, you know, when I think about health and wellness and I, I just think about life, there are certain things that you, if you do A, you're going to get B. Yeah. Right? Like, it's not miraculous. This is what's going to happen. If you don't do A, you'll get C or whatever you're going to get. I know that if we don't create a culture of discipline and exercise and nutrition, which is not necessarily easy, if we don't create that, I know what the implications are going to be for my children later on. Yeah. Well, let's look at the implications. You live in America. There's what a study from a few years ago s suggesting that over 80% of people in America have some degree of metabolic dysfunction. I don't think we're quite as bad in the UK, but I'm pretty sure it's probably over 60, 70%. That is the norm. That means the norm right. is sick, right? And, 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 and honestly, I yes. say that with compassion, but we're here to try and help people and and sedentary sick uh, and sedentary yeah and, and and another uncomfortable truth which i think is yeah. worth um bringing up here i don't know your experience here with patients i i've been a parent as i say for 12 years and congratulations like, thank you but <laughs> yeah, it's not an easy thing it's, it's really not, not easy, easy thing. and i would say one of the most powerful things i've learned is that kids don't do what you tell them to do. They do what they see you doing. Hmm. And so certainly what I try and do in our house, and I'm not perfect, but I try my best. They're always seeing daddy doing squats, doing press ups, yeah. lifting the kettlebell, out in the garden, doing sort of bear crawls. They're, they're always being absorbed. It's just, you know, and so often, you know, they just join me and do it with me or do, oh, daddy, we're doing squats. All right, let's do it. I'll do it with you. And certainly in the UK, there's a lot of talk that girls, particularly when they reach uh, teenage years, it's a big mm -hmm. problem in this country with physical yeah. activity in females. Now I'm interested, is that the same in the UK? Uh, sorry, oh, yeah. is that the same in America? Yeah. 
And I don't know, do you have any strategies for that? And how important do you think this kind of modeling is? I, I, you know, three years ago or two and a half years ago, I would have had no in, input into this. But being a parent, what I see already is that the way in which we teach and model, really, you see it in these little people. And I, I believe that it is difficult once individuals get older. You know, I, I don't know because I have I don't have a 12 year old yet. You don't have a teenager. But I can imagine that it becomes much more challenging. And I would say that seeing the generations around me, um, I'm a bit discouraged. I'm a bit discouraged in their physical capacity. And I believe that if we begin to teach our children, we as adults, if we begin to impart that on our younger children and even our, our teenage girls, I think we're going to see a change. Yeah. Um, I, I do believe that there is a culture problem right now, unfortunately. Um, I don't know, I think, the how to rectify that. I'm not sure, but I will tell you physical activity and hard training uh, fixes many of those things yeah. because it, it, it takes mental fortitude. It really does. And, you know, you mentioned stress. And of course, you know, stress can mean lots of things, physical stress, psychological stress, yeah. emotional stress, all kinds of things. And too much of the wrong kinds of stress that we don't learn to manage, yes, can be incredibly problematic. But mm -hmm. there's a lot of great research, isn't there, on how doing more and more physical activity helps you become more resilient to stress and actually deal with stress better, which I find super interesting. Yeah. Just to finish off on your second recommendation, strength training three to four times a week. Mm -hmm. Can you just expand a little bit? Is it 20 minutes? Is it 30 minutes? I think a great place to start is, you know, it, from my perspective, thinking about, um, you know, volume is number one. Volume is the amount of uh, reps you're putting in, the amount of sets, the amount of work you're doing, uh, volume, frequency, duration. These are all things that we have to think about when building a plan. And I definitely believe people should work with a fitness professional. Um, so the recommendations that I am giving are recommendations that I have seen work in clinic and just work with other patients. And of course, uh, that is very valuable and it's in the literature understanding that three to four days a week is just a great baseline. I, I don't believe that that is necessarily optimal. I guess it really just depends on the load that a person is using, the volume that they are using, but easily I recommend typically multi-joint movements, compound movements, whether it's a squat like you are doing, a deadlift, a bench press, um, kettlebell carries, those kinds of things, full body movements I think are very, very valuable rather than isolated activities like a bicep curl or tricep. I do think that that is valuable and I, I do that myself. Yeah, I yeah. think really starting, depending on what uh, someone is, is working on, there's some really interesting work in terms of the amount of exertion. So for example, Stu Phillips in Canada, he will show and has shown that like, say, for example, we have older individuals who are listening to this, you don't have to go heavy, you just have to put in the volume, and there has to be enough exertion. All of a sudden, the body doesn't get to you're doing a 12th rep, and then the rep, okay, so now I've hit 12. And my muscle is is stimulated, or I have some kind of hypertrophy happening. It is about perceived exertion, where perhaps you're going to failure, and you can't quite do any more, and you're working multiple body parts. Um, you know, I think that body parts should be worked at least once a week, but I mean, that's kind of the bare minimum. So all body parts could easily be worked twice a week. Yeah, a few things come up there. So there's then functional movements, which have yeah. real crossover to regular life. So, you know, squatting or lifting mm -hmm. things over your head and things, things that actually yeah. are very practical that will use lots of joints, lots of different muscles. But then you compare that to, let's say, a single, you know, an isolated movement like a bicep curl. Now, clearly, something like a bicep curl is not going to be as practical uh, or, or have as much functional crossover right. as, let's say, a squat, which requires your hips, your knees, your ankles, your balance, your abs. Um, but just to highlight that point, if you are losing skeletal muscle, like everyone mm -hmm probably is after the age of 30. Right. And you mentioned anabolic resistance, which is super, super interesting. Presumably anything is better than nothing. 
So, absolutely. Yeah. So absolutely. That, I think that's a key message because we're so far from optimal that Abs for some, some people may go, what, four times a week, 40 minutes in a gym, no chance. And I don't want anyone to finish this conversation and not yeah. then go, I'm going to start moving my muscles more. And listen, we've seen, um, you know, the high intensity interval training, you will get a ton of benefit from no time. And there are multiple ways to stimulate tissue. And I hesitate to say that because listen, the more intense of the exercise, the less you can do. Yeah. And typically the greater the impact. So for example, if you're going on a light leisurely jog and that takes an hour, you will get arguably, um, an equal effect in a fraction of the time by doing any kind of high intensity interval training. Yeah. That being said, I think we do have to prioritize muscle in, in terms of time. And the idea that could we design a program that could be incredibly efficient? Totally. Look at what CrossFit did. Incredibly efficient. Yeah. But is that necessarily safe for everybody? No. Is it setting us up for a reframing of a life site, of a lifestyle? We need to really prioritize muscle as a pinnacle mechanism, muscle as medicine that we actually have control over. There's very little that we actually have control over. For example, you and I could do an overnight fast and my muscle or my liver glycogen could deplete 50% and yours could de deplete 65%. We don't have voluntary control over that, mm. right? And you can't think your muscle glycogen. I mean, some people may argue that they can, but you can't think your muscle glycogen less. Utilizing and leveraging skeletal muscle is one of the very few things that we actually can directly influence. That's insane. We can actually influence the amount of stimulus that we're providing. And could you do it cardiovascularly? Yes. But again, you don't have direct control over, I mean, you may, but it is not you know, I mean, I think it would be very difficult to sit here and to reproduce a physiological state in my body of running your 5k. I don't know if I could do it. Yeah. But I point. do know I could walk over to the corner and do 15 squats. And I know I could put that effort in and I know I could induce uh, physiological changes in my body. Yeah. So all that to say, could we be more efficient and does and can it be less time? Totally. I think when you get to the point where you've created a discipline, then you can begin to scale back on time. I think that there is a friction for beginning and a friction for execution. We just need to kind of rethink that. Yeah. Just on that subject of efficiency and a, and a lifestyle, a few weeks ago, uh, my family and I went on holiday uh, to Greece. And it's really Beautiful. interesting. Yeah, it was it was lovely, much needed after a long book tour and, you know, all kinds of things this year. It's been busy work here. But it's really interesting. And I shared this in my uh, Friday email last week that, you know, we didn't take many bags. So I packed a skipping rope because I knew we'd be Love it. chilling yes. a lot. It doesn't take any, uh, there's no weight, super simple. And what I would end up doing before breakfast, sometimes out on the sun, looking at the ocean. Incredible. Every now and again, I'd just do some skips. And then before, I think on the first day, I ended up over the course of a day Incredible. doing like 500 skips. And it sounds a lot, but these were in little one minute segments of Incredible. high intensity. And then I just it said in my head, okay, every day you can do 500 skips. And so for seven days, yes, I was chilling. Yes, I was enjoying time with my wife and family. Yes, we were walking sometimes or chilling Incredible. in the sun by the pool, but I was also getting 500 skips in a day. Now, the reason I share that is because I hope that's maybe gives people some ideas that it's not always about a gym, having a personal trainer, like, let's make this easy. I'm not saying skipping's for everyone. But what's your take on that seven days, 500 skips a day whilst Incredible. on holiday? Incredible. So you're creating a stimulus. Again, it is what is our endpoint? So you're creating a stimulus. You did, it sounds like you did pretty anaerobic activity. It sounds like you put in quite a bit of effort. Yeah, it was tough. Uh, it, it was tough. That's amazing. Again, there that is great for insulin resistance. It's grace, it's great for utilization of substrate. You know, it is great for disposal. So you disposal of glucose. You could have ate breakfast and then 
you know, skipped rope, put a continuous glucose monitor on, and I bet you see a decrease. Yeah. So again, it doesn't have to be this thing. It doesn't this thing. have to be. I think that is a brilliant idea. I am going to actually take that idea. I love it. <laughs> and, Put it in your book. Do it. Uh, yep. And I, I think that, um, again, creating a stimulus is really important. And you did that. And that is in and of itself is amazing. And again, can you get a, can you do body weight exercises? You can. Um, those might take longer. And that could be a great starting place for people. Um, yes, I think that that is very valuable. Yeah. And again, we go through seasons. As long as you are training and doing something outside of, regular kind of leisurely walking and, and really putting in meaningful effort, you are going to make improvements. Something you said before that I want to make sure I've got right and make sure we've hammered this point home. Let's say someone in their 30s, let's let's take a, I don't know, a particular movement. Let, let's take a bicep curl just because it's easy, low risk of injury. Okay. I know it's not a yeah, multi joint yeah, yeah. movement. And let's say someone at 30 can lift a particular weight 10 times in each great. arm. Okay, great. Now, if we're saying after the age of 30, for most of us, there's gonna be a decline in right. our muscle mass. Is it fair to say then, if you are still only doing 10 bicep curls off yes. that same weight at the age of 40, then relatively your strength has gone down. Like, I guess the point I'm trying to, you, I see what you're saying. You, I, I, I don't, maybe it wasn't the, the best articulated question. The idea I'm trying to get at is you want growth, you want stimulus. Yes, we you don't... want to see, you want to get stronger. There, there comes yeah. a point, and we don't know exactly when that happens, but there comes a point where you become less strong. There seems to be this tipping point. Maybe it's in your 70s or 80s, but there is a tipping point where all of a sudden you cannot do these major overhead lifts or these really heavy squats. But you, at 40, you definitely don't want to be there. You should be stronger at 40 than you are at 30. I don't actually often see that in the gym. Mm. I, I see that people are lifting the same weight or um, perhaps they're already getting uh, less strong or more weak. You don't want that. 40, you are still in the prime. 50, you are still in your prime. Yeah, that's empowering. That's still empowering that there's stuff that we can do. Now, is there a difference between women and men in terms of this decline? Because obviously women have perimenopause, the menopause. Yeah. Maybe speak to some of the yeah. differences, please, between women and men. Yeah, I, I, I love this and appreciate this lead in. Um, women typically have lower muscle mass than men, just based on body size. We also have less anabolic hormones, testosterone. In terms of when women, we really see a decrease in muscle mass and strength is often around menopause. When estrogen is low, that is really when we see changes in female hormones, estrogen, progesterone, there are receptors, there are hormone receptors for estrogen on the muscle. It is not really well studied yet. It is just, again, in its, in its infancy. What we do see, and of course, there's a, um, a misbalancing of testosterone. Sometimes testosterone remains high while estrogen, progesterone go low. It really just depends on the woman. But overall, during times of menopause, this is when we see the greatest decrease in skeletal muscle mass for a woman. Wow. Um, and actually, it doesn't necessarily have to happen. This is the time where I often have women really pick up their skipping rope or their high intensity training. This is very important also because as estrogen goes down, there is um, a mechanism, and we don't actually know why it happens, of less movement. Women move less. The estrogen creates a decrease in that uh, non-exercise activity, which is just kind of, you'll see me, I'm fidgeting, I'm all over the place. It decreases. Mm. Menopause is a really important focal point, the idea that women have to gain weight and lose muscle is not true. This is incredibly important because if they up their dietary protein, really manage their caloric intake, modify their carbohydrate intake and understand that carbohydrates really become a meal threshold ingestion and increase high activity in terms of interval training and resistance exercise, you can absolutely, and you know, if you are in the scope of being able to do hormone replacement, this would be a great time to do it. These, um, that decline in muscle can be circumvented. 
Yeah, this is a very important message. Okay, very so- important. Very important, very so important because women are hopeless. They hit menopause and it sucks for them or they've seen their friends go through it and it sucks for them. And it uh, physiologically and physically doesn't have to. We're not training to become better at exercise. We are training to become better at life. And you are doing actions that allow you to become better at life. And if people understand as they are going into the new year, let's say you don't like exercise, fine. Think about how you are going to cultivate yourself to become better at life. You just talked about how going out in the rain, it's dark and cold, and you got your physical activity. You also kept a commitment to yourself. You also put a notch in the fact that you are much more likely to go ahead and take that action in the future. Mm. It didn't matter that it was raining. It didn't matter that it was cold. You're actually, yeah, you're cultivating your muscle, but you're also cultivating your resiliency. Yeah. It makes you an individual who's not willing to negotiate and you're not negotiating with yourself. The brain does a lot of things. The brain likes comfort. The brain tells us not to do all these things, but the brain is just an organ that pumps out thoughts. That's just what the brain does. It doesn't mean that they're relevant. It means that one can be discerning. You can have all the thoughts that you want, but when you commit to an action, you don't wait on motivation. You don't have to force yourself into doing anything. You might have a, a moment of negotiation, which is exactly what you did, but you took action. You're much more likely to take action in the future. And you build upon that, which is exactly the goal for society. How do we become stronger and more resilient as a society mentally, which then begets physical resilience? For that person who wants to get into strength training, let's say they heard our first conversation together and were inspired, but life got in the way. They haven't quite got round yet to bringing resistance training into their lives. Or perhaps someone's coming across you, Gabrielle, for the very first time and is going, wow, I didn't know skeletal muscle was that important. Let's maybe go through a couple of scenarios here. For someone who's never done anything, and let's say they're in their 40s, how would you advise that they start getting into resistance training? Well, you had mentioned that you have a great coach. And I think now that we have access to online coaches and, and there's just a whole host of information, find a modality that works and be under the guidance of someone or at least curate information. There's tons out there. Because when you start, you are going to have much more of a response than someone who is who has already been training. The just doing basic body weight stuff like push-ups or squats or moving your body or doing lunges, this is an amazing place to start. You are doing something, again, when we talk about resistance training, moving your body weight would be considered resistance training. Then you graduate to bands. If you want to use bands, I think that that is very, very, very helpful. It is easy to do at home. And then after you graduate from bands, and let's say you are doing things, I think being able to squat, get off up off the floor, because again, we are training for life. Being able to do a push-up, you have to be able to fall well. You have to be able to push yourself up off of the ground. Let's say you don't want to do any of those things. Then you pick up a couple heavy bags and you walk and you carry them. Eventually, you progress to kettlebells. What are actions that you do within your normal life that it will allow you to get better at doing those things. Yeah, We know that people have to carry groceries. We know that you have to, if you are traveling on an airport, that you have to put your uh, suitcase overhead. We know that it is very critical to be able to get off the floor if you were to fall. Begin to think about things within life and put actions to those things. Let's say, I don't know, you don't want to buy weights. So maybe you spend $20 and you get a weighted vest on Amazon. Mm -hmm. There are a whole host of opportunities and options. And there's only one wrong way to do it, by the way. And that's by not doing it. Yeah. I, I circle that quote in your book. There is one slam dunk way to exercise wrong. Don't do it at all. So I think that's empowering. You know, at the start of this conversation, you mentioned how you did geriatric medicine early on in your career, as did I. My second or third placement as what we call the senior house officer, so our second year as a junior doctor, 
was in charge of the care of the elderly ward at the Western General Hospital in Edinburgh. And when we think about these functional movements, and it's hard, right? I get it. In my 20s, I wasn't thinking about what do I need for when I'm 70 or 80, right? But something so practical that people probably don't think about unless they've seen it with, you know, like we have in our patients, to go to the toilet, you need to be able to squat, right? And it is something that people take for granted until they can't do it. Mm. Again, I, I know that may not land for someone in their 20s or 30s who's listening, but I hope it does because nobody wants to be that person when they're older. No one, I don't think anyone would choose to say, yeah, you know, when I'm older, um, I hope that I can't get up and down off my own toilet. I mean, no one wants mm. that. It doesn't mean people can't have a quality of life when they have that with help, I, for sure. But that's a very real thing for people to think about when we're thinking about, you know, functional exercises and what we need to be able to do, right? And it's also not if challenges are going to happen, it's when. It's not an if thing. It's a when thing. You train for life and you train for sickness. And I know that that sounds morbid, but the more healthy muscle mass you have, the more resilient you are going to be in midlife and later on. And the time to take action is now. The wor- the best time was yesterday. The second best time is today. You have to take action and you have to do it regardless. It's not that it's going to get easier. So if people could think about what the future is like, you don't have to think about yourself. You know, if you're in your 20s, you're thinking, well, that's in another 30 years. And I will tell you that as someone who is not in their 30s, as you and I are both not in our 30s, that the actions and the habits that you develop now are much easier addressed now than they are later on. Being strong and being capable and taking the action necessary is your best health insurance possible. It is not an if, the, when these things are going to happen. It's a when, whether someone gets the flu and they're laid up in bed. Uh, an older person might lose two pounds of muscle if they are on bed rest for seven days. Yeah. The more healthy muscle mass you have going into any kind of um, disease or illness, the more capable you will be to fight it off. Also, I have never heard a patient say to me, you know, I regret being strong and capable. I regret that. Never in the history of ever. There's something also about strength training or exercise or training full stop that I don't think people talk about enough, how it makes you feel, right? When you can lift something heavy, when you're able to go on a one hour hike in the hills and you're able to do that, you come back and you've given yourself a shot of resilience. You feel like a capable, strong human being. We can talk about what having muscle mass does to lower inflammation, improve the health of your immune system, lower your risk of cancer, all those kind of things. Great. But it also does something arguably more important than any of those things, it gives you confidence in yourself. I know. Isn't it amazing? Muscle is the cornerstone to longevity. And what is longevity? It's not just living longer. It's living happier. It's living more capable. It's being able to fulfill what you intended to fulfill. You're absolutely right. It makes you more confident in the way in which you show up in the world. It makes you more physically capable. It's incredible. It also makes you more independent. Yeah. You said start wherever you're at. There's plenty of online resources now. You said if you can get a trainer, get one. Let's just think of two more scenarios, okay? One scenario is that person who thinks, trainer, you've got to be kidding me. I've barely got enough money to pay the bills, put the heating on and feed my kids. So to them, they may be thinking, no chance can I afford a trainer. I may not even be able to afford a gym membership. So I want your take on what that person can do. And then I want you to move on, if you don't mind, Gabrielle, is to another person who 
thinks, you know what, I'm pretty good. You know, I've been listening to Ronga's podcast for a few years. I've been implementing some of the advice. I've got energy. I've lost a bit of weight. My mental well-being's better. I'm now prioritizing health in a way that I never was. What is optimum? What would you ideally have me do? And let's say this person is in their 40s or their 50s. I wonder if you can give them your top prescription based on what I've just told you. Those are two great questions. We'll start with a person who is really struggling financially. YouTube is free. I would suggest going to YouTube and finding body weight exercises. There are a whole host Mm. of ways that you can get healthy if you have access to a computer or a phone or even the library. So the library is free. You can go to the library. You can get online there. You can go to YouTube and there are actions and ways in which people can execute immediately. Again, it doesn't cost anything to do push-ups. It doesn't cost anything to do squats. And what happens is over time, you can continue to increase the amount. So let's say when you start, you can do 10 squats, well, then you can do 20 and you continue to push yourself, which would lead me to the second question that you asked. So number one, if finances are very tight, YouTube has a ton of free resources. If you do not have a computer at home, you can go to the library, a free public library, and listen there. Yeah. And I just want to add to that something you, we were talking about before about self limiting beliefs. That individual, if they go to work somewhere and they have colleagues, there's always that colleague somewhere who, you know, takes pride in their appearance and is really buff and clearly works out regularly and likes to train. We're often fearful about asking others for advice or help. You know, I challenge someone listening to this. If you're that person, go up to someone who you know trains and say, hey, listen, you know what? I want to make this year a really good year for me. I can't afford a gym. I don't know where to start. Would you mind showing me two or three simple exercises that I could do by myself at home? I think it's another, I know some people get really scared about doing that, but if you can lean into that fear and actually go and ask someone, people want to help right? People who train, they'd be delighted to say, hey, listen, no worries. I was there once before, 10 years ago. I didn't know either. I'd start with A, B, and C. So that's all I was going to add to to, to what you just said there. I, I love that. I love that. Now let's talk about the next question that you had asked is someone is in their mid 40s. They're already prioritizing their health. What is their optimal goal? I love this question. My challenge to them would be, you should be training to get better at multiple different modalities. You pick one and you train that up for 10 to 12 weeks, depending on whatever your goal is. For example, let's say you are really great at doing a bench press, squat, and you've been training in this hypertrophy zone. I would challenge you to get better at high intensity interval training. And how would you do that? Well, you would measure it. So for example, if you were going to go on a rower, you would say, you would test yourself, find out where you're at. How long is it going to take you to row 500 meters? You'll get a baseline and then you'll continue to improve that. Or you can do a ski erg or a airdyne bike, but really understanding that the key with training, just like the key with life, in my opinion, is that you strive to become better at the thing, if weightlifting is easy for you, continue to do that. Now pick something else. Maybe you're not good at yoga. Maybe you're not very flexible. Lean into that. There are so many fun ways to train. Let's say I don't have time to go to the gym. I will find a creative way to train that potentially I'm not good at. I'll throw a Bulgarian bag, which is a kind of off-centered bag. I'll throw it over my shoulder. Maybe that's 35, 40 pounds. And then I'll pick up a kettlebell. And I'll be walking in my neighborhood. So I'll have a Bulgarian bag and a kettlebell in one hand. I'll walk up and down. Maybe I'll lunge, turn around. I'll do it again. Might be something that I'm not good at, but I'm always trying to leverage the movements that potentially I'm not good at. Yeah. Because that's what life's about. You don't just continue to do the thing that you are good at. You do that and then you add to it and you get creative and you figure out your weaknesses and you leverage your weaknesses because fitness is multidimensional. Let's say you love training hard. 
Maybe you need to add in some yoga and get more flexibility. Mm. Maybe you need to add in more stability work. Yeah, I love that. You're clearly off the, maybe a similar mindset to me where you're, you have no problem going out into your neighborhoods, wearing crazy stuff or putting, you know, weights on your back and going rounds. Okay. I think that would be me. Whereas I think many of my patients, a lot of my family, a lot of my friends would go, no way. But that could be applied in your house, right? Let's say you've got stairs. Well, you could pick something up and go up and down your stairs, couldn't you, right? You don't have to do it in public if you don't have that kind of, I don't know, self-confidence, whatever you might want to call it. Or maybe you should. Maybe you should cultivate it. And the first three people that look at you weird, good. Keep going. Because then the next time you do it, you're not going to feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Or maybe, you know, you can keep testing yourself. Wear, uh, I don't know, your kid's headband. Be crazy. But it's just that initial restraint that we put on ourselves. Yeah. You can do it. We're touching on something which I think you covered towards the end of your book in the section about environment design. And you talk about these four, I guess, avatars, the performer, the solo act, the chameleon, and the reluctant. Can you explain how you came up with those four and just walk us through each of them? Because I think all of us will go, yeah, that that's probably me. Oh, that's probably me. That's my partner. That's my brother or whatever it might be. I, I really loved it. Yeah. Well, really these came from, and by the way, there's probably more, but this came from just seeing patterns of people. And once you figure out what kind of person you are, you know how to get the best of yourself. So a, a soloist is a person who they don't care about external stimuli. They prefer to train alone. They will either turn music on or not. It doesn't matter. These are highly, highly driven individuals that are working out their own stuff. Doesn't matter where you put them. Doesn't matter who is there. Doesn't matter. Um, these are the people that will train, by, like David Goggins. David Goggins isn't going to care who's around, right? He doesn't matter it, it, whether someone, whether there's a camera there or whether there's not, that guy's getting it done. A chameleon, a chameleon type of patient will, you can really put them in anywhere and they'll make it happen. One of my best friends, Don Saladino, who if you guys are looking for training, uh, online training, he has many, many programs. This guy is such an athlete. It doesn't matter. He can train alone. He can train in a group. You drop him in anywhere and he's dominating. He just loves training. The reluctant is uh, a few things. Uh, reluctant, uh, a reluctant patient is they actually do want to get better, but they'll tell themselves that there's no point and they've tried everything. So what's the point? I'm just going to stay at home and eat whatever I want. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what's the point of me, you know, uh, training because my body composition is not going to, not going to change. Um, it's not really going to matter. And, and those are the people that there's typically a lot of pain involved, right? That they're just not, um, they haven't really identified that there's a risk that they might not achieve the thing that they're looking to achieve, which by the way, just taking action allows you to get better either way. Hmm. And I think that that's really important. And what was the last one? There's one more. The performer. Oh, these, the performers are the best. Now, these are a lot of the people that you will see on stage that are very much out in public that do better being witnessed, mm. meaning they can go to a gym. They might not want to train with anybody or want you talking to them, but they need to be in an environment where people are witnessing them. And it's not this because they will push themselves mm. knowing that they are being witnessed. And again, it's not this ego thing. It's just the way in which they seem to function best. Um, many entrepreneurs, again, they'll be so competitive within themselves but they don't necessarily want to do it solo. yeah. And they don't necessarily need a training partner, but they will have to go to a gym to quote, get the environment right. Yeah. So I'll give you an example. I take care of a very well-known entrepreneur and he was training as a soloist. How good do you think his workouts were? Terrible, terrible. Because he didn't want to go to the gym. He didn't want people to recognize him. But for a performer, to be training solo, it's like the kiss of death. So he'd go to his home gym, do a couple reps, be on his phone. This is boring. We put him into the gym. Even if the gym, we'd find out when he, the gym wasn't busy, go to the gym, would go there with a the trainer, kind of keep people 
at bay, completely crush his workout. So knowing how you navigate your environment is crucial mm. because you leverage your environment for success. Yeah. A huge part of this conversation has been about getting to know yourself better, understanding yourself, knowing your limitations, knowing your patterns, knowing when you go off track, right? I had planned to do a masterclass on muscles today with you, and we've probably done a fraction of that. But nonetheless, I think this is so, so valuable for people because this is really where it's at if you want to make changes. If you enjoyed that, I think you are really going to enjoy this conversation about the most important things that you can do right now for your health and longevity. If at 37, your limit is just being able to run that 30 minute park run, at 75, you're gonna have a very difficult time getting around. 